Good evening. In compliance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, I call to order an information session meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, October 13th, 2022 at 6.17 p.m. A quorum of the board is physically present at the AIC Central Office to conduct this meeting. Board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. This meeting is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It is being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum, Astound Broadband, and on channel 99 through AT&T UVerse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And to our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you for joining us. We will move to the approval of the agenda. Secretary Singh, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Anderson to approve the agenda, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. Uh, Secretary Singh, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Members, next is an opportunity for the public to share comments publicly on any topic of their choosing. We have time for up to 60 speakers, and as a reminder, the district continues to provide time during the regular voting meetings of the board to hear from the public about agenda items for consideration and vote. This is an opportunity for the board to take part in active listening. While we wish we could respond or provide feedback, we are required to limit our questions to requests for clarification or follow up directly to the administration. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public portion of the meeting called a dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to audio record their remarks. And we will now play the recorded messages for public comment, so please listen carefully. Good evening. I am the parent of an orchestra student at Lamar's Fine Arts Academy. Due to budget constraints, Lamar is now sharing McCallum's orchestra directors, who are both excellent, but are being asked to do an impossible task. 170 students, double concerts, double regional, double UIL competitions, double trips, not to mention the commute between both campuses or the music programming cuts at our children's schools. It's not sustainable for our directors and nonsensical at what are supposed to be our flagship Fine Arts Academies. Is there a plan to support the fine arts programs at these campuses and other district campuses? If not, students and families need to know. I would imagine the district risks losing great educators if you continue to put these demands on them. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. I appreciate you serving on the Board of Trustees and advocating for what is best for our teachers and students. Good evening, my name is Candace Hunter and I'm a parent in the district. I'm calling to ask the board to begin progress monitoring of the essential areas redesign. Many of the predicted challenges have proven to be correct. The inability to fully staff the initiative, campuses with less than the minimal minutes of art and some with no music and overcrowded gyms. Most disturbing is the amount of academic TA still needed while there's now a pool for PETAs. I'm also requesting progress monitoring of six at elementary. Assurances were made to parents that their students would have the same access at elementary as they would at middle school. Most notable is the lack of equipment for band, orchestra, and science. Eighth grade science start is a progression and the foundation is laid in sixth grade. Finally, I was saddened to hear from another parent that has chosen to leave AISD because of the challenges they face with special education services. In her own words, she said, quote, Honestly, I feel like a bit of a traitor for going to a charter, and I'm furious that no one within the school administration, not teachers, they were fantastic, were w was willing to try and help. Not only were we dismissed and patronized, but 
student name omitted was scolded and shamed. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Yara Flores, parent of two dual language AISD students. I'm asking for the board to consider a recommitment to the dual language program and its implementation throughout high school and especially in testing grades. We are seeing a big drop in implementation of the target language in testing grades and that isn't fair to the model and it isn't fair to emergent bilingual. Again, I ask that the board consider re-implementing it and staying committed to dual language through all testing grades. Um, board members, this concludes our public comments. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Tr uh, Trustee Anderson. Um, two uh, requests. Uh, the first one has to do with the fine arts at um, Lamar and McCallum. Um, just uh, would like to know a little information as to the what to understand the why and uh, essential area redesign, um, an update at some point on how things are going, challenges. We can provide both. We'll first check with the Lamar piece for more details, uh, and we'll be able to provide that to you all, uh, as well as an update on the essentials and implementation, because the monitoring is taking place right now. Thank you. Can, can you also um, send us information about uh, the caller that talked about recommitting to dual language? Did we uncommit? No, ma'am. We still maintain our commitment. Uh, matter of fact, tonight, uh, as a you know visual display of our commitment, we'll actually have an update on a recent uh, audit of our program, and so we are okay. still committed to supporting uh, the dual language program here in Austin ISD. Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee Singh. Um, this is a follow-up to the question about um, the essential areas redesign. Uh, do you happen to know how many um, of our campuses are not fully staffed yet um, for the essential areas redesign? I do not happen to know, uh, but I I see Brandy back there trying to do some mental gymnastics, uh, <laughs> but if she doesn't have it on hand, we can provide an update uh, to the board. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Thank you. And um, and I also does, this is kind of a little bit separate, but I noticed that the YouTube live stream at least is not working for me. Um, it says video unavailable. Um, so I don't know if that's something that our staff can take a look at. I know it's available on AISDV, AISD.TV, um, but um, I think a lot of people like... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like we are going to... We have it fixed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, trustees. Any other um, questions? And then, Trustee Sabada, just to add to what you were asking about, uh, I think um, the parent who was asking us about recommitting, I know we've also uh, committed as a board to look through the budget and, this, and dual, dual language programs are one of the items that we have agreed with the administration to take a deep dive in, just to make sure that we, we, are, we know all of the investments we're doing and are committed to implementation of that program. In fact, this coming year will be the second year in the largest number of students with seal of, of biliteracy, of which um, they were describing. But, um, but anything else that we can do around that, I'm sure we're gonna, we'll, we'll do it. Well, that's helpful because uh, that's what 
I, I recall, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to make sure the community knew that yeah. where we were on that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Trustee Bosman. And I would like to add, as we're talking about budgeting, um, with the call about the arts, making sure that we really are talking about what that looks like and where we're, where we do um, have missing people district wide. I know the a lot of the staffing was based on choice sheets, which were really based on a lot of the arts um, programs lost students during the pandemic because it didn't make a whole lot of sense to be in always an orchestra or theater or a lot of our arts programs when you weren't present physically on a campus and, and really that we're not staffing for post pandemic, but that we're really staffing for what we expect people are looking for and what we've historically been looking at. I would like to make that arts funding um, just a really honest look. Um, we did cut the arts and really an honest look at what that looks like um, and what it would take to bring, bring it back to a level that I think aligns with what our community um, values. Thank you. Great, thank you. Trustees, any other questions? Um, if not, as a reminder, please feel free to, as a reminder the, to the to the community, please feel free to share any general comments or questions on non-voting items with the board by email at trustees at austinisd.org. We're going to move on to the next item, which is the president's report. Uh, for tonight's president's report, I just want to say a few words about the importance of mental health and self-care. Um, I think I've shared this story with some of y'all, but my grandmother used to say when we would leave the house, um, she would tell us, cuidense, take care of each other. And I think mental health and self-care is really important in this school year. Mental health is an integral component of maintaining good overall health. When individuals are mentally healthy, they're able to realize their own abilities, cope with the normal stressors of life, and make positive contributions to their commitments. Being able to be true to yourself is one of the strongest components of good mental health. And addressing the mental health needs of students and staff, addressing positive academic outcomes for all. And students are encouraged to talk with a campus counselor or other trusted adult to learn more about support on each of our campuses. And our staff also has resources available through our employee resource, uh, I'm sorry, employee assistance program. And we appreciate everything the administration is doing to try to meet the needs of our teachers and our, and our staff around that. As an update, um, last month, uh, our board voted on a resolution committing Austin ISD to net carbon zero emissions by 2040 and setting goals for electric buses with a commitment to having a fully electric fleet by 2035. I wanted to share with the, uh, my board colleagues and wanted them to know that we will be bringing the resolution back for an amendment this month to recognize the need to protect our current employees. We want to assure our valued transportation employees that we will not be outsourcing any work related to our transition to an electric fleet. And also wanted the board to know that we're working with Education Austin on adding language to protect jobs of our current mechanics. And this is an opportunity to support the training of our employees and support the transition from diesel to electric buses. And so finally, I'd like to just highlight two upcoming community events. First, this Saturday, Austin ISD will hold its Hispanic Heritage Celebration and Talent Show at the Austin ISD Performing Arts Center from 2.30 to 4 o'clock. This event will celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month with music, performances, and recognition of our students and staff who have submitted their talents in the virtual talent show. And second, the following Saturday, October 22nd, from 9 a.m. to noon at the Palmer Events Center, Austin ISD will host the Campus AISD Showcase. All schools, including elementary schools, will have the opportunity to showcase their campus to our students and families and district departments will offer exhibits for Austin ISD families to learn about numerous programs throughout AISD. An on-site enrollment will be available for families to choose Austin ISD and free shuttles are provided from multiple areas of the city. So please visit austinisd.org backslash showcase to learn more about the event. So I'm gonna move um, to Item number five, the scorecard. And tonight we'll be discussing scorecard items nine through 10, staff retention and professional pathways for teachers data 
Dr. Mays, could you introduce our next item? <clears throat> I can, and thank you. Uh, for everybody, we know that our focus right now uh, is heavy on climate and culture. Um, and I know that we're, we're always having conversations about uh, looking at best practices across this district. And so Ms. Hosack uh, and Ms. Ortiz are here to share how we're all collaborating, uh, working together, uh, leaning in and taking advantage of our advocates and experts uh, and improving our retention rate. So I'll turn it over to those, to them. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President Rodriguez and Dr. Mays. My name is Brandy Hosick and I'm the Interim Chief of Human Capital. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. We are here to review and provide an update on scorecard goals nine and 10. Goal nine relates to teacher retention on Title I campuses specifically, and goal 10 is overall staff retention. Before we begin, I want to make sure that we maintain a focus on how these particular goals tie back to student well-being and student outcomes, as that is our number one job. Second, I wanna be clear that we have not done enough, not nationally, not as a state, and not as a district to retain and sustain staff. We have to support and sustain our staff so that they can do that for our students. And we have to be very intentional with that work. I will speak to the data as it is and as it compares to the state and national trends for context, but that context is not to be used as justification for our own data points and our trajectory. We have to own it, we have to innovate, and we have to become more responsive in real time. So, uh, Jacob, next slide. So this data is exactly the same as the board report made in May of last year. As a reminder, teacher retention is a lagging indicator on taper. These are official numbers based on taper reports, uh, and that will come out again in January, which will represent turnover rates for 21-22. For Specifically, it measures teachers uh, on, on staff and in teaching positions in the fall of 2020 in comparison to that same group in the fall of 21. Based on projected numbers, which are shown in red, we were slightly below target for goal nine, which is one campus, uh, which is title one campus teacher retention and slightly above target for goal 10, which is overall staff retention for the 21-22 school year. Next slide, please. We do know, however, that everyone is justifiably more concerned with where we are at, at this exact moment in time. Again, using sep September 1st as a comparison date, We've run preliminary numbers for goal nine to, pro to project fall 2021 to fall 2022 retention. We are projecting an overall 72% retention rate for our Title I teachers, counting those that transferred to non-Title I campuses and those that moved into non-teaching positions. However, removing those in order to keep with our methodology, Title I to Title I, teaching position to teaching position, the true retention rate of Title I teachers is projected to be about 67.3% and that's denoting an approximate 12% decrease in teacher retention on Title I campuses. Next slide, please. Similarly, we've also projected num uh, numbers for goal 10, and we preliminarily show a 77.5% overall staff retention, uh, which is an approximate 8% decrease from the year prior. Next slide. Again, I wanna be clear that we must do better and be more intentional with our efforts to retain and sustain our staff. Given that as our laser focused goal, we are listening and learning as much as we can so that we can not only, only respond, but be more proactive and take steps to disrupt that trajectory. I want to reference a recent study conducted by the Charles Butt Foundation. Uh, the study is a random sample, statewide poll of Texas teachers. And I do hope that everyone even remotely involved with public education reads it um, because you have influence. The issues that we're trying to identify and solutions to those are all right there. And our teachers are telling us exactly what they need. So on this particular slide, what we see here is, I'm sorry, Jacob, uh, from 20 to 2022, almost a 20% increase in those that are considering leaving the profession. Uh, we are at an all time high. We see that 81% of teachers have said we are not compensated fairly. And only 17%, again, across the state feel that they are valued. That is an incredibly uh, saddening statistic that, that we need to intentionally work on. 
Um, a lot of these factors come with with feedback that we're hearing from teachers that it's become untenable. Over the last decade, it has been more and more and more and more and no intentional conversation about what can we take off of your plate? What can we stop doing? What is not necessary? What can the district do for themselves? What, what, what can we take away? And we have to have those conversations uh, now. Next slide, please. Again, 77% of teachers in the poll reported wanting to leave the profession. Of that 77%, 94%, I'm sorry, 90, 93% have taken an actual concrete step to doing that. Another stat that's not on that page is that 44% of current teachers in, in jobs right now are actively looking. And I would probably bet that 44% is probably pretty generous. Uh, I think it, it is going to get higher as we go through the year, um, especially if we are not intentional on how we proceed. Uh, the top two items on that particular, on the right side is again, salary increase, and we do have to do a better job about bringing the most comprehensive uh, compensation plan that we can forward for our teachers for this fiscal, uh, this next budget cycle. And number one, paramount to even salary, is a positive uh, work culture and environment. And the only bright spot to that is that we have control over that indicator. We have full control over our culture. And so um, again, that is where our work is going to be focused. So next slide, please. So uh, this graphic is actually taken from Southern Regional Education Board, um, SREB that works tightly with uh, Texas Education Agency, but these are really the main levers that SRAB uh, says this is, this is what it's about for teachers. And so starting on the right side uh, with school leadership, we absolutely know how powerful uh, a principal is and, and the, the amount of influence that a principal has on a campus with their staff. However, a principal can't do it by themselves and an organization must be a supportive organization for them as well. And, and the adage of you don't quit your job, you quit your boss uh, is really not true if the organization is, is not in line with, with those values. So we need to make sure we're supporting our, our principals first and foremost because they are such an important lever um, so that they can support teachers, so that they can support students. Moving down to the bottom, we are going with coaching and support as, a, as another major lever. Uh, we need to do a better job of onboarding. That's one of the very first, that is the very first bullet. We have to do a better job of bringing people into our district and getting them acclimated and getting them um, uh, everything that they need. Getting them a technology from day one, getting them making sure that they are set up in pay systems correctly, making sure that they have access to an e-number, a badge, email, the things that should just be very easy for us to attain. We have to do a better job of that. And that's new hire and onboarding. And onboarding is not a one-day event. It should be an, an, a yearly, uh, across at least one, if not two-year process of really what is onboarding. Uh, we need to, we, we have invested our time in, certainly in the discussion for professional learning communities and feeling that, that support from your colleagues and being able to do that work together. That is a major lever for teachers. Um, moving over to the left side, this is where we are doing some of our targeted work in human capital. Uh, competitive compensation. Uh, making sure that we, again, put together the most comprehensive uh, compensation package that we can for the next budget cycle. Favorable working conditions. We, every single meeting that I go to, um, I harp on this about making sure that every, every interaction we have with staff, every single one, that is your employee experience. And so it's not just how you're onboarded, it's not just how you're paid, it's not just how you're treated, it's all of the things. And so really understanding what an employee experience is about. Um, again, teachers needing to feel a sense of connection and belonging, and we're talk gonna talk a little bit more about that in just one second. And then teachers having agency, and I'm so happy that they use that word. Uh, we do hear autonomy used quite a bit, and that is absolutely a thing we all want to be treated like professionals and have autonomy within our space, but agency, agency is really about ownership. And that is the difference for me between 
autonomy and agency is how to how to own it collectively and move forward and, and again still have that latitude as a professional. And then uh, last bullet on that on that particular lever is employee resource groups and we're actually going to talk about that as well. Finally to the top, uh, opportunities for teachers to be leaders. That's an incredible opportunity and, and teachers really want those those leadership opportunities on their campus. Um, and we are coaching our principals to create distributed leadership across their campuses to give those opportunities. Uh, again, um, strategic compensation, this graphic refers to it as performance-based pay, and then awards, and, and we certainly are focused in on that as well. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, please. I did place our values as a district into this presentation. I think that if we go back to who we are and what we say we are about as far as Austin ISD and we really operationalize, that's the word I, I've been using with staff, is operationalize these values, we can absolutely take care of indicator number one, a positive work culture. If we can do this and do what, what we have um, stated on our website and in everything we do on our scorecard, it, it will come naturally. And our, and our people will, will feel cared for. Next slide, please. This graphic is out of our Employee Experience and Sustainability Department. Um, just a, a few more data points here. But really feeling a sense of belonging is so important to, and this is not just teachers, this is for everybody. I know that part of the, one of the number one reasons I, I love being a principal so much is because it's your family. It, it is who, it is, I, I saw those folks more than I saw my own family members. And so having that sense of connection and belonging is, is, is incredibly important. Um, and we know that we have better attendance, we have a higher per, uh, engagement rate when we have that, that level of connection. Uh, and as far as recognition, you know, people who, who feel recognized at work are four times more likely to be engaged than those who are not. And we have to continue to do better about recognizing excellence in this district. Um, and then, of course, uh, certainly a focus on our black, African-American, and Latino, Latina teachers, making sure that we are recruiting and sustaining teachers of color. Uh, it is incredibly important that we, that we have teachers of color on every single campus, administrators of, of color on every single campus, because it is good for all students. We absolutely need to make sure that we are focusing our efforts there. Next slide, please. So retention data for AISD suggests that black and African American and Latino and Hispanic teachers are leaving the classroom at higher rates than white teachers. And to create a sense of belonging community, our department, our employee experience and sustainability department is doing intentional outreach and support uh, for our teachers of color specifically. Last year we did uh, opportunities, for example, the Blanton Museum of Art uh, Teachers Networked, explored various perspectives, examined art, and participated in relative discussions. Austin Area Urban League, the, the, the Urban League sponsored an, an event at Punchbowl Social and included networking with community organizations um, across the city. Uh, we are in the process of planning and implementing additional social connections for this year. In fact, we just had one um, two weeks ago, I believe it was, uh, at, the, uh, at the Wildflower Center with uh, the Umlauf Sculpture Garden in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. And we had a turnout of over 80 participants. We are very excited for that uh, and had a wonderful time with our teachers. We will continue to offer social connections to novice teachers to build community and connection as part of retention efforts and looking to engage more with our anchor teachers, which is a new term for us. Really our teachers that have been with us for a long time and they are so pivotal to, su to the success of their campuses. Um, and we are highlighting them on social media and we are writing stories about them and we are certainly making sure that they know how important they are, that they feel that, that level of value. Uh, employee resource, gr uh, resource groups, this is actually a concept out of industry. Uh, and, and we have um, a sincere need to catch up with those, those strategies out of, out of private sector. And so employee resource groups are voluntary, employee-led groups, which is really important. It's, it's not focus groups, it's not a task force, it's not anything led by HR or administrator, it's employee-led. 
inclusive workplace uh, to, to that the aim is to foster a safe, diverse, inclusive workplace aligned with organizations that they serve. So Frost and ISD specifically, the goals are to promote an inclusive environment where teachers of historically marginalized backgrounds feel seen, feel valued, feel included, and empowered to embrace their identity and create a safe space to share lived experiences and process learning. Provide targeted support for educators who experience unique challenges because of their race. Cultivate optional learning and connection environments for all educators, particularly educators of historically marginalized backgrounds. And the initial phase of ERGs will include the following groups, black African-American teachers, Latino, Latina, Hispanic teachers, and LGBTQIA teachers. Uh, a diverse ERG steering committee has recently been established and we are looking to launch employee resource groups um, in the fall. And then uh, one, uh, one more um, strategic initiative that we are that we have started already this year is a, is a professional learning opportunity for, for central office staff. And it is incredibly important that our teachers and our campuses, uh, our, our principals on our campuses feel that central office is a place that they can come to for support and, and that they will be given what, whatever it is that they need to meet the needs of students. Again, that's what we're here to do. And so we are, creating this learning experience for our central office staff so that we can ensure exceptional and equitable customer service for all. Demonstrating customer service standards so that we can model uh, what it is to be customer focused, action oriented, responsive, empathetic uh, to, our, to our campus uh, staff. Building and maintaining trusting relationships through relational effective and efficient strategies and promoting a culture of respect. Again, going back to our values. Um, promoting the culture of respect and employee well-being. We, we have not, and it, it's incredibly, um, it, it's not that novel of a concept, but we have not engaged our, engaged our central office leadership team the way that we should have and the, the way that we're able to, so we are being very intentional about that. The other thing that we certainly want to make sure that we are intentional about is, again, going back to that graphic, Jacob, you don't need to change the slides, but if you go back to the SRIB graphic about strategic compensation is that's again, part of an overall employee experience. And so um, in recent weeks, we have actually merged our employee effectiveness team with our employee experience team because if, if those two things are disconnected, then we are not using both for good and being synergistic with, with, the, with the capabilities. So um, Amy Ortiz is with me tonight and I'll allow her to take over from here. But again, that, that, that synergistic approach between those two departments is incredibly important and I think will um, bear, bear fruit for us for sure. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> good evening. Um, Dr. Mays, Board President Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. My name is Amy Ortiz, and I have the privilege of serving as the Interim Executive Director of Employee Effectiveness, Experience, and Sustainability. Um, so tonight, I'm gonna share a brief history of PPFT, um, the context around the revisions to the appraisal that were implemented last school year, an overview of the 21-22 PPFT data, um, and the adjustments and additional supports that have been put into place for the 22-23 school year. Next slide, please. So Professional Pathways for Teachers is the result of a collaboration between Austin Independent School District, Education Austin, and the PPFT Oversight Committee to design and maintain a human capital system that blends appraisal, compensation, professional learning, and leadership opportunities for all Austin ISD teachers. PPFT was designed to elevate and professionalize teaching, empower teachers with a system for continuous professional growth, and leverage the state teacher evaluation requirements within a local human capital system that includes permanent base salary increases. PPFT appraisal was piloted in 2014-15 with 20 campuses, and we moved to 35 campuses in 2015-16. And after two years of refinement and feedback, the PPFT appraisal replaced PDOS as the official teacher evaluation system in AISD in 2016-17. This timeline was built to align to the rollout of the new TEA requirements around teacher evaluation. The state requires all districts maintain a valid and reliable system to measure teacher effectiveness, which must include classroom observations and student growth. 
PPFT compensation was voluntary in the first phase um, of a multi-year program scale up. Teachers opted in annually to about 1,000 available spots um, and chose to connect their PPFT evaluation to compensation. All teachers began participating in both appraisal and compensation in the 2020-2021 school year. Next slide, please. So the ultimate goal of the PPFT appraisal is to promote professional growth for all teachers, encourage more frequent and formative feedback, and incorporate multiple indicators of success. The PPFT appraisal system was designed as a collaborative process between the teacher and the appraiser meant to foster open and collaborative campus cultures that focus on instructional growth, supportive feedback, and the development of individual and school-wide practices that effectively increase student learning. Next slide, please. In the summer of 2019, with the passing of House Bill 3 and the creation of the teacher incentive allotment, AISD voluntarily submitted our local PPFT system data to TEA and Texas Tech University for analysis um, in hopes that Austin ISD could take advantage of the funds available under TIA um, using our existing structures. In the fall of 2019, we received the feedback from Texas Tech University um, that our system application would likely be denied if we did apply for the teacher incentive allotment if our system was submitted as is, um, because they saw several valid, sorry, validity and reliability issues um, within our appraisal itself. These issues included the holistic scoring of our rubrics at the broader strand level rather than individual indicator scoring, our four-point scale when a, a five-point scale was suggested as a system norm, and the negative correlation of our teacher observation scores and our student growth measures. Um, they also had feedback around our final rating scale and our distributions not being proportional um, or within normal ranges when compared to other systems. Next slide, please. So this feedback prompted the PPFT um, appraisal revision process with our PPFT Oversight Committee, which is a group of teachers, administrators, um, and a few central office representatives. They worked on these revisions throughout the 2020-2021 school year. The committee chose to take advantage of the revisions process to really redesign our rubrics to reflect AISD priorities around equity and cultural proficiency and inclusiveness that were not existent in our previous rubrics. So the committee was tasked um, with ensuring our system was both reflective of our AISD priorities and values and also met state requirements around a valid and reliable system to measure teacher effectiveness. Next slide, please. After the revisions were complete, we had a full crosswalk analysis done of our PPFT rubrics um, compared to the state's T-test rubric and also compared to national models in Danielson's Framework for Teaching and Marzano's Focused Teacher Evaluation Model. Our PPFT strands and indicators directly map to T-TESS, Danielson, and Marzano. So the conclusion um, was that PPFT is measuring the standard observable expectations for classroom observation rubrics across the nation. Next slide, please. So to provide some historical context of our PPFT distributions, um, in 2018-19, the data that was provided to TEA and Texas Tech University showed 95% of AISD teachers in the effective or better categories, with 75% of our teachers scoring highly effective or distinguished, 19% in the distinguished category. Due to the COVID-19 school closures in the spring of 2019-2020, all staff evaluations were waived, but AISD chose to complete modified evaluations without the student growth measures and with only one observation um, in order to create a path to points for our teachers to award compensation. About half of our teachers were participating in compensation at that time, so we found a way to apply a modified evaluation to award compensation. In 2020-2021, TEA offered and AISD applied the student growth waiver, so we again modified teacher evaluations to only one observation and a professional growth and responsibility score. 
no SLO or school-wide value added scores were applied. That year, 99% of AISD teachers were in the effective or better category, with 91% scoring highly effective or better, and 48% scoring distinguished. Next slide, please. The 21-22 um, school year, the state offered no waivers. So for teacher or principal evaluations, so we returned to the full multi-measure system and the revised PPFT appraisal was applied. This includes two formal observations by two separate campus administrators. It includes informal walkthroughs for feedback and coaching. The professional uh, growth and responsibilities component, which includes a formal teacher self-assessment to inform that score. And the state required student growth measures, which in Austin we use student learning objectives or SLOs and school-wide value added. Next slide, please. Of the nearly 10,000 formal observations scored on the new PPFT rubric in the 2021-2022 school year, the average score was a 3.96 on a five-point scale, with 50% of our teachers averaging a 4.0 or higher on their formal observation. Next slide, please. The school-wide value added measure was not part of the 21-22 PPFT revisions. This component has been part of the PPFT appraisal at 10% of the overall score um, since the original design of PPFT. The original design committee chose this measure as a way to incorporate state accountability measures, but ensure that we're prioritizing growth over achievement. School-wide value added is calculated annually by SAS EVOS, who is the industry standard for K-12 statistical modeling. Students are given an expected growth measure based on their own individual testing history when available, and also comparing them to students of similar demographics across the state. SAS then reviews the state STAR and EOC data um, from the prior year for all AISD students and measures how close each student's actual growth came to their expected growth. And then students are given a score on a one through five scale based on standard devi deviations above or below their expected growth. So student level scores on each campus are averaged to give the campus a reading and a math score. And then we average the reading and math score to give the campus a school-wide value added score. This score is worth 10% of both our teacher, our PPFT evaluation, and our campus administrator, our CAPER evaluation. Next slide, please. School-wide value added is a lagging indicator, meaning in a standard year, this score comes from the previous year's STAR and EOC. In 21-22, in the absence of available TEA waivers and in the light of the context around the 2020-2021 STAR, um, we did apply a best of alternative that was proposed to the oversight committee and they made that recommendation to leadership. This means the standard one year trend data from the 2021 star was reviewed, but we also reviewed the three year trend data, which included growth measures from 2020, 2020, 2021, 18, 19 and 17, 18. These were reviewed for each campus and the higher of the two scores was applied towards the PPFT and CAPER evaluations. The best of score did provide a higher score for approximately 34% of our campuses as they received the three year trend rather than the one year trend. Next slide, please. For the 21-22 school year, 77% of Austin ISD teachers were rated effective or better. After collecting um, teacher feedback throughout the year and reviewing our final data and rating distributions, in May of 2022, the administration took several proposal, um, proposed adjustments to the PPFT Oversight Committee for a recommendation. Next slide, please. The first was to adjust the final rating scale um, and those cut points so that school-wide value added could no longer mathematically eliminate a teacher from any final rating category prior to the start of the school year. The scale was also adjusted at the highly effective range after review of scores across the district. The PPFT Oversight Committee recommended this adjustment in May. Um, leadership accepted that recommendation and the scale has been adjusted for the 22-23 school year. Next slide, please. 
The second proposal was to, to adjust the number of informal walkthroughs required. Um, while walkthroughs are not a scored part of a teacher's evaluation, they provide frequent feedback and coaching, and they do require a time commitment from our administrators. So this proposal shifted the requirement from four each semester to three each semester. The PPFT Oversight Committee did recommend this adjustment to leadership. Um, this recommendation was, was accepted, and the walkthrough requirement has been adjusted for the 22-23 school year. Next slide. So PPFT compensation is a unique system um, that is local here to Austin as it provides a second way to permanently increase teacher base salary. This is in addition to any board approved raises or eligible stipends that teachers may receive. PPFT compensation differentiates teacher pay based on their appraisal rating, their campus type, and any optional professional development or leadership opportunities that a teacher may choose to complete under the PPFT system. This does mean that every teacher in AISD has their own individualized rate. PPFT compensation is base salary increasing, which means it's permanent and it compounds over time as well as being TRS eligible. Next slide, please. There are five elements where a teacher can earn PPFT compensation points. All Austin ISD teachers earn one point per year for being a teacher under the PPFT system. And teachers are all, el all eligible to earn um, points from their appraisal final rating. Points are awarded, awarded for effective, highly effective, and distinguished ratings. There are also optional components of PPFT compensation that teachers can choose to complete for additional points. So we have professional development units, or PDUs, which are mini action research projects of a team of three to six teachers. Um, where they attend or focus on some professional learning. They implement those strategies in their classroom, reflect um, at the end of the year, and upon successful completion of this process, teachers earn three compensation points. Leadership Pathways is a two-year micro-credentialing process that teachers can complete with a cohort of their peers, but under the guidance of our district content area experts in our academics department. Teachers choose a pathway of interest in one of our five district priority areas. Um, currently, we have a literacy and language, differentiated instruction, PBL, SEL, and transformative technology pathways. <laughs> Teachers complete 12 hours of professional learning each semester, and upon completion of this two-year process, they earn 15 points. We also um, have our Leadership Pathways Plus Three and Leadership Pathways Ambassadors, which are ways that teachers who have successfully completed these programs can continue to um, help us increase capacity, build capacity in other teachers by coming back and mentoring, presenting professional learning, scoring Leadership Pathways submissions um, in order to continue to support the program. We also have our PPFT Campus Contacts. There are our teacher leaders, who are our campus line of support for teachers participating in PPFT. They help disseminate district information, direct teachers to resources, um, and these teachers receive an annual stipend. As teachers earn points, they're cumulative, and they earn base salary increases as they cross levels. Um, not every level, or not every point they earn will cross the level every year but the points are cumulative. We don't start them back at zero every year, so they will always be paid out on the points that they earn at some point. Next slide, please. PPFT compensation differentiates based on a campus that the teacher works on. So this was designed intentionally to recognize the unique needs and challenges of some of our campuses to further incent and retain teachers at our campuses of highest need the PPFT system identifies enhanced compensation campuses. Enhanced compensation is defined as the top 25% of campuses at each level with the highest annual instructional services index. This considers the percentage of economically disadvantaged students, percentage of students served in bilingual and ESL programs, and percentage of students served with special education programs. Our campuses with an overall F rating who do not qualify in the top 25% are also included. Enhanced compensation is, was designed to provide recruitment and retention support to our highest need campuses. All teachers work on either a standard or an enhanced <coughs> campus, and this is our list for our 22-23 school year. 
Next slide, please. So some adjustments or updates to our compensation framework in order to further support retention and recruitment efforts at our highest need campuses. Um, an additional five campuses who received a TEA not rated were added to the PPFT enhanced compensation list for the 22-23 school year. Um, the teachers and administrators on these campuses were notified in September of their enhanced camp, uh, compensation status and that will be applied this year. To recognize retention and recruitment efforts on Title I campuses specifically, a recommendation to create a three-tier system with standard Title I and enhanced points being awarded was taken to the PPFT Oversight Committee at our first meeting on October 5th and received um, support from over 90% of our members. So this addition to the framework will apply starting in the 22-23 school year. Next slide, please. So the system is not perfect and we have work to do. Um, and as we work to align and bring clarity to the system, we are continuing to add additional supports, resources, and streamlining where possible. Um, the employee effectiveness team has been deployed to campuses for the entire month of September and October to um, meet with teachers and administrators, offer support, answer questions, hear frustrations and feedback, um, and opportunities for improvement. Human Capital is working closely with the offices of academics and school leadership to align our common expectations across the organization. When we bring system clarity um, and coherence, then we can better support our teachers. The intentional shift of the district testing windows allows teachers to use CLI Engage and MAP as their SLO in order to reduce initial testing and that's been very well received. Um, our ongoing partnership with Education Austin and the PPFT Oversight Committee will continue to review and analyze and find ways to improve and refine our system. Um, and then lastly, Employee Effectiveness has entered a partnership with Texas A&M Education Research Center to complete an extensive program evaluation on the revised PPFT system to determine validity and reliability, and this report will be shared with the board upon completion. Thank you. That concludes our presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Um, trustees, now is the time for us to ask questions around the current vision. Our goal tonight is monitoring and ensuring our reality matches the vision presented. So when asking questions, we should try to focus on the data presented, asking questions about who, what, why, and how. And I, uh, I want to recognize Trustee Anderson, who's had her hand up for a bit, so sorry about that. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, you touched on some stuff that, that um, I, I believe you just have skimmed the surface. Um, when I saw the um, data on there about black and Latino teachers, that is deeply disturbing, but I can't say I'm surprised. Um, so for me, what, what does, what is the intention of the employee resource groups? And that's the start, but how will you, what is the plan to close the communication loop? So if this, if this group is indeed a resource, if I'm coming to the group with a, a general concern and I'm looking for feedback that may need to go to the administration, how would that information come back to me as a teacher? Thank you for the question, Trustee Anderson. Uh, the intention is to provide connection uh, for, for our teachers. It, it, we see connection really in so many ways, connection to the organization, connection to your role within the organization, connection to one another. And so the, the entire um, premise behind employer resource groups, and again, this is coming at, straight out of industry. Um, for, for example, during our, our teacher, um, our superintendent uh, uh, teacher advisory group last night, how connected it is to places like Google, like Apple, and this is really initiatives that, that, are, that large corporations are adopting. Um, 
it, it is otherwise known also as affinity groups as well, but the entire premise is to find connection and, and a sense of belonging. Um, because again, as you mentioned, the, the data is alarming and you can only infer that I don't feel like I belong here uh, as a teacher of color. And so nobody's given me any support to feel a sense of belonging. There's no intentionality around that. And so that is in direct, um, it's, a, it's a direct way to address that. Um, but to answer your question about closing the loop, is, it is a teacher-led uh, group. It is not human capital-led nor administration-led. Um, but there are going to be leaders of those, uh, of those groups and there is a, a direct connection back to the steering committee. And the steering committee is, again, from all facets, facets of, our, of our organization. And so there is a way to have that information flow back up so that that information and, and items of concern that arise during those groups can flow back to administration and that we can take action to improve that. So I, I would hope that um, the administration use this as an opportunity to really um, get to the why. And that is gonna be a uncomfortable conversation um, I can go into some of the things that I have been told, but um, it is a, a long-standing issue that I hope in uh, sooner rather than later, uh, we begin to get on the path to, address, to really address it, not just, not just talk about it or you know, form another committee about it, but really, really put some action behind it. Um, representation doesn't matter. Absolutely. I can, I can name five people from when I came through here, and that really, you know, really inspired me. And it is as as a student, you know, who is coming up through AISD, and you don't see someone who looks like you. Why? should I go into a profession if I don't see anyone that looks like me who can maybe guide me to say, hey, this is, you know, these are the steps you need to take. So how do we plan to address that piece in this? I mean, it's, I know that that is there and I know we have talked about it year after year after year, but what is the plan to actually address it? Again, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna be very blunt in my answer and my response. Yes, ma'am. Um, we continue to circle the drain on this because of the people at the table who, who are the decision makers at the table. And so um, if I'm being quite frank, um, the, the data that you're seeing and the results that we are getting sh should not be surprising because it is the system that is built by the dominant voice. And so we are using employee resource groups as certainly a way to adhere to our values of see, not only having but seeking out the most marginal, historically marginalized voices throughout every corner of this district. And so um, I said this the other night at, at, at the equity retreat, it, it takes people that look like me to disrupt other people who also look like me who built that system. So that is the intent: is to is to absolutely bring bring people who have been historically marginalized, as bring them to the table as decision makers, and yes, take that feedback and do something with it, not just say, well, if that's a checkbox. We have an employee resource group. There, no, we have to we have to we have to operationalize what is coming back out of that group, and and make that change. Well, that's, that's kind of why I asked you about the communication loop, because I can, I can be a resource, but if the information that I'm given as a resource, it, it's not impacting anything, then what am I resourcing? It, it, would, it would simply be for, um, again, um, 
uh, again, a checkbox, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it would not be to, there is no authentic um, reason that we would actually have those other than just a compliance. And so we have to make sure that we are listening. The entire reason that teachers are leaving this profession, especially teachers of color, is because they do not feel heard. And so we, again, number one, number one on the list of, of why teachers are leaving the profession is to feel valued and to have a positive work culture. And again, we have full control over that. So if we continue to circle the drain and continue not to listen to the feedback, we will continue to get the results that we've gotten. Heard, uh, Trustee Anderson, heard and the social connection piece. Uh, Ms. Al Dr. Aldalco, who presented on the ERPs uh, last night, she's not gonna allow it to just be um, something that's just heard that she doesn't act on. Uh, she's very passionate about these employee resource groups. Um, and so I know that she, you know, takes this work to heart and that's actually why we've moved it pretty slowly is because she wanted to get it right. And I know that she's not here tonight, uh, but she's leading that. Uh, and I know that, uh, again, she does that work with great intention to provide social opportunities for the groups that don't feel, uh, like they have a voice or have an opportunity to just, again, uh, be around, you know, uh, colleagues that they feel like look like them, sound like them and accept them for who they are and so i know that that's work again that she's doing with intention so my my request well i'll get to the request after this discussion um what are we doing to support or what systems are we putting in place to support uh ineffective teachers and how do we monitor that they're making progress So <clears throat> there is a requirement if a teacher falls into the ineffective range um, that they be placed on an intervention plan, there is a structure that has to be followed. So if the intervention plan has to connect directly to the areas where um, the expectation was not being met within the PPFT rubrics, there has to be a timeline set on that intervention plan. So it's not that it goes on forever indefinitely. Um, there has to be structured supports in place and documented that, that the administration and the, the district are doing things to support the teacher to meet the goals that were falling below expectation. Um, and then that plan has to be monitored on a regular basis. And the teacher has to have the opportunity to be successful um, and close out that intervention plan. There are, there are very few um, teachers who fell into that ineffective range. I believe it was 22 um, this past school year, but that, that data comes directly to employee relations. Employee relations reaches out to the campuses to ensure that they're aware that those plans have been started, are being monitored, um, and that those teachers are set up to be su supported and successful. Do you look at, um, say, challenges that may hinder one's ability to be effective? So if I'm on the campus, um, say I'm a year in, and you know maybe my, my job is being hindered by something that is out of my control, how much does that factor into a teacher being ineffective? So the Texas teacher poll actually refers to that. They ask teachers what are the barriers to being effective. Um, and some of the things that teachers reported were lack of non-instructional time to plan, um, lack of student supports and services, um, and um, the there are definitely, we survey our own teachers. So there, there are a number of things that teachers um, tell us are barriers to feeling like they're effective um, or, or attaining an effective score. But the main things are around time and support, um, professional learning, mentoring, which I know um, we, are, we are working on restructuring some of our mentor processes for our, our new teachers. Um, but it, it's those, those supports and, and services and time to do the planning that it takes to be an effective teacher. In addition to that, I would also say that 
and we coach our principals this way, is that the entire job of a, of a campus administrator is to remove the barriers that impede success for either the student or the teacher or both. And so we need to make sure that those conversations are happening outside, outside of a PPFT conversation as just coaching from administrator to teacher about how can I help you? What is it that you need? And having that open dialogue about, again, removing those barriers to success um, so that, that teachers can, can, can feel successful. Um, last thing is a, a request for the resource groups. I'm just, I'm requesting, because I don't just want it to be meeting to be a resource and like, that's it. You know, if we're really talking about moving the needle on um, recruitment and retention of um, teachers, specifically African-American and Latino, um, the, the groups, there has to be some communication with uh, the administration and for the board to be able to hear the feedback. So that would be my only request at some point um, in that communication loop that you loop it around to the administration and the board so that whatever the, the issues are can be addressed and I'll be sitting on that side, so I'll be here fussing at those of them that will be up here. Um, because this is, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can't stress enough the, the impact a teacher has on a student. And when you don't have a teacher that looks like you, you know, to, you know, guide you or to tell you, hey, you know what, I think you'd be really good as a teacher. Like, if you don't have that, I mean, I, I, wow. But my request, <laughs> the board, the administration, in that communication loop, and at some point, um, maybe letting the board and the administration know the progress and what action, action, keyword, action yes, can be taken. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Anderson. Trustees, other questions? Trustee Singh and then Trustee Zapata and then Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you all so much. What a fascinating and in-depth <laughs> presentation. Really appreciate it. I yes, know you guys have been working like crazy. Um, I really appreciated that you thought about our values. Um, I always pull that up during these discussions as a, kind of a North Star. And, um, and I can see how much you are doing um, to improve the morale, to ensure that we're keeping our teachers. Dr. Mays, I just wanna give a shout out to you because I see how you interact with our staff. Mm. I talk to people in the community and I'm like, so how's Dr. Mays? And you know, and they, people really do like you. You know, they, they do, <laughs> validation. But you know, like they, but it's not just that they like you, but I feel like people feel heard um, which is really just so important. So just thank you for that. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, you know, we've been talking about just, and this is just like a general thing. Not one thing we haven't talked about is the connection between like teacher morale and, re and enrollment, student enrollment, because our community goes to our teachers when they ask, hey, where should I send my kids to school? Is AISD a good school district for my kid? And so there's gonna be so many other positive effects of the work that you're doing, so thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I kind of went back and looked at the panorama survey that we did as part of our scorecard. Um, and I know that this is not really a discussion of that survey, but it is very relevant, obviously, to this discussion. <laughs> Um, and I would like to request, um, like, you know, th there was a stark difference between how teachers felt about their campuses versus how they felt about the district. And I want us to touch base on, I don't know if there's an opportunity for us to re-administer just a few of these questions, like in December or so, um, just to kind of get a mid-year, are we doing that already? Yeah, we're doing it right tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah, we're Love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So are you guys asking, so the three questions that I, I'll just say I'm really most curious about 
are, um, there was one that's where teachers rate district leaders take steps to solve problems. Is that on there, Jacob? Okay. <laughs> are you doing all the questions? It's the same question. We're doing all the questions. Yeah, that's the same question. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, great. Um, and then there's an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect in the district, and the district has a clearly defined mission and vision for all schools. So that's that's great. Yeah. yeah. So we have all the questions that were on there last year in addition, based off of feedback that we heard from the staff, staff small groups that we did following last year's survey. We also included an open-ended section for, for that subsection that you just talked thank about. Thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to hear that and can't wait to, um, to see. I, I imagine it's gonna, we're gonna see some big increases on some of these just based on what I've been hearing from folks. So, cool. Um, I did wanna ask about, um, okay. So as I was listening to the PPFT discussion, there are a couple of things that I'm trying to reconcile and I'm trying, I would love to kind of hear how you all are working through this. So when you talk about the validity of, of the PPFT, uh, which basically means is this PPFT actually measure what we think it's measuring. And so a little data point for me that has just really, um, that I've been thinking on is, you know, our, our district, you know, we, we have people who have won awards statewide and district-wide, and they're not in the top, they didn't get the top rating, they didn't even get the second rating, they got the third rating on our system. And so to me, that's a major disconnect, and I'm sure you see that too, because we've talked about that. So can you talk specifically about that Absolutely. issue? How are we making sure that the teachers that we know are good are getting distinguished? Yeah, so one of the things I'm sure you heard about was the school-wide value added measure. So um, we did make sure that we solved for that issue with adjusting the rating scale so that that can no longer mathematically eliminate any teacher um, from any category. However, um, part of the reason that we adjusted the effective to highly effective range is for just the reason that you mentioned. We did okay. go back and pull um, specifically some of the teachers that we know have won those awards and been put out there as these, you know, um, exemplar teachers and go through individually of each element of their scores and try to, you know, gauge, maybe we, we missed the mark, maybe we cut the, the, the cut points too tight. And so that was part of the rationale for adjusting. Um, not only that for school-wide value added at the mm -hmm. distinguished level, but between that effective and highly effective range as well. Okay. Um, but PPFT is a multi-measure system, and so only one of those measures is determined you know, at the district level, which actually SAUCE EVOS calculates that. The other measures are determined at the campus level, and so we have work to do around inter-rater reliability, um, calibration, increased calibration, <laughs> Um, training and resources so that we're all on the same page, mm -hmm. that we're looking for the same things, that we are recognizing what um, quality teaching looks like in classrooms, and that we're using the same measures across all campuses. Um, and so that's something we're really working on as a system, um, that we're being intentional about the number of checkpoints and, and touch points that our administrators have with the rubric, mm -hmm. um, and in those calibration activities, and there's someone walking up behind me. Okay, <laughs> I thought someone was coming to join us. Sorry. Sorry. Um, but yeah, we we are making sure that because calibration and iterator reliability is a huge part of whether a system mm -hmm. is valid, mm -hmm. um, because we are a big system, and we have you know 343 administrators implementing this system across, mm -hmm. and so just continuing to refine what are our expectations and what does that look like mm -hmm. in practice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. that, I'm wondering, if, do teachers know that you guys made these changes? Like, is there like a handy, like one page guide or something that can just. Yes, so okay. we sent out the changes um, right before they all left for summer break last year because the oversight committee, the last meeting was in the middle of May after we had all the data back. So okay. that's where we were able to make these adjustments and recommendations that leadership accepted. Um, but all teachers are required by the state to have an annual orientation around the way they are appraised. Okay. So all of our teachers are required to complete 
um, an online orientation, and this was the, the first thing that they saw okay, in that great. orientation. Was, that. Guess what changed? <laughs> so, would yeah. you mind sharing just that slide with with the trustees so that we can have that? And sure. Share of course, that with folks. Of course, the adjustments. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. And we do have work to do. I'm, I'm looking at school leadership just because that they, they are again where the rubber hits the road in terms of implementation. Uh, and so we have to do a much better job of sense making. Uh, we had our teacher focus group last night. And, uh, Amy graciously stayed behind for about an hour. Uh, just again, sense making for a teacher that had challenges. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do a better job of growing capacity at our campus level so that again, principals and assistant principals can have those conversations with those, with our teachers. Uh, just because I know Amy, Amy, you know, while the resident expert can't have every single conversation yeah. about what it is we're doing with PPFT. And so we're working on growing that capacity as a I system. I, I, I talked to her last night about uh, doing videos because I, I said every time we have a question about PPFT, we can't just send them to Amy. <laughs> yeah, that's great. An Amy podcast. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to ask was, um, you know, thank you for connecting the, the Charles Butt Foundation um, report. I, I had the chance of I had the wonderful opportunity to actually go and see the presentation, and one of our former employees was actually giving the presentation. Mm -hmm. It was the counselor from Ann Richards School. Okay. Yeah, and she was awesome, uh, by the way. I was like, come back to AISD. <laughs> so, but anyway, besides the point, um, one of the things that was really compelling to me and one of the findings they had was um, the one of the biggest retention challenges is that teachers feel like they have too many responsibilities right outside of teaching so when you take that little fact and then you take the the data that i think it was kxan just did this past week on like where the vacancies are in austin isd most of them are on the east side okay so now the teachers in our east side schools are probably taking on more responsibilities because they don't have enough staff there and so just seeing how those two merge together and ultimately how that impacts students i would love to just get like your take on vacancies east side austin teacher retention absolutely it's all wrapped up in, in yeah. it, into a, a vicious cycle really uh, yeah. if we cannot if we cannot retain then we are in a constant churn to try to recruit and if we cannot recruit enough, then the responsibilities continue to increase on already overworked uh, and overtasked employees. Mm -hmm. And then those employees will again fall into the same data category of, I, I can't do this, it's untenable mm -hmm. because of the amount that, it, that is placed upon me. And so we ha again, we have to disrupt that cycle. And so I, I think the disruption factor is, is sustainability within the system. Again, because you have to stop the churn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are uh, being very intentional about that. We are asking very specific questions in, in our Title I teacher survey about, about getting down to that granular level mm -hmm. uh, and, and figuring out ways that we can intervene. Uh, but again, we have, to, we have to stop piling on and we are trying to create uh, ways with our principals to think certainly innovatively until we can, again, mm -hmm. I think level set and, and move forward with that. But we have to stop the churn of just, yeah. okay, just recruit more. Just, it's fine. The, the well is dry and we have yeah. to make sure that we are taking care of who we have. And so again, Trustee Singh, I think it goes back to, can we really take a look at the have tos mm -hmm. and the not have tos, the optionals, the optional, mm -hmm. um, um, pieces that are on teachers' plates, yeah. uh, so that we can m make the job what it, what it is really supposed to be, yeah. which is about teaching students and and growing our kids. But but again, you are correct; it is a vicious cycle. Yeah, like I, I don't know what the answer is, but you know how do I mean? This has been going on forever in AISD and probably every other district in Texas, where you have the most vacancies in the schools that you know where the students are probably most concentrated and coming from poverty and trauma and so like you can train up the teachers that are there as much as you want but if you don't have the qualified teachers to begin with you're never going to get the achievement where you want it to be so i'm just trying to figure out like you don't have to answer right now but i am curious at some point i would like to know more about what is our specific strategy for for 
Title I schools? I, I think it's also about um, taking a good, good hard look at, at resource allocation as well, because mm -hmm. uh, that comes down to it. Uh, we had a conversation the, just the other night about how can we, again, if we continue to do the things that we've done, we're gonna continue to get the same results. So how can we be innovative? And although we know that we have um, a finite dollar amount, how can we utilize, how can we re-leverage that and utilize that better to provide those supports to our most vulnerable schools, to our most vulnerable students? Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I think, I think many, much of that begins at the elementary level. Yeah. But Trustee Singh, those conversations are taking place. I mean, we do have some Title I schools with high retention rates. Mm -hmm. And so we do have opportunities for those leaders to sit and talk uh, with other leaders who may be struggling with retention rates uh, to talk about, like you said, best practices that are being utilized. And we actually do that outside of some of our other planning meetings just to give everybody the platform to, to brainstorm and share uh, ideals together. And we do awesome. that intentionally just to provide uh, leaders those opportunities to grow from one another. And we will have human capital support partners uh, having intentional conversations with Title I principals this year about what are some concrete steps that, that we can take right now. Um, we will get our first round of data back in about two weeks from now, and we will have one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of our Title I principals to be support partners uh, on how to think through those, those concrete strategies. Thank you. Um, and so the last question I have is related to the actual board monitoring report. So on page one, we have the percentages. So it looks like, you know, about 80% of our, um, the retention rate is about 80% for Title I schools. What is like, what are the dates that, your guy, that you guys use to kind of measure start and finish? Yes, ma'am. So, so the, on the board monitoring report, it's taper reports, which is taken out of snapshot, uh, which is the last day in October. Mm -hmm. And so, um, our unofficial numbers are taking September September one to September one okay. um, for for our again for our, our our tentative data. But what you're seeing on the board monitoring report in official numbers, those are taper report numbers. Okay, all right. And do we have the data that shows? So it looks like you just took all the Title One teachers. Um, I mean, you know, and did it, so we don't. But do you guys have the campus by campus data to see how much turnover there is on every campus? Yes, ma'am. I would love to see that. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Trustee Sabata. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. Um, so thank you for um, your report. And, uh, you know, I've been an a education advocate for over 30 years, been in many schools. And uh, I remember when we started organizing in, in the Alliance schools, principals would say, I am a recovered dictator. That's what I feel like I am, because they never really, um, they felt like it was their responsibility to take care of everything on campus and didn't really understand that, yes, you're going to be held accountable to that, but you can organize a team to do it with you. And so, and I think that goes back to, because I said, they didn't teach you that at the university. Uh, well, they don't. They don't. They don't even teach teachers how to work with parents. So, you know, so it's not, leadership um, is something that is developed. And so, um, and there's different meanings for everybody interprets it different. So, um, I, I, and I think we are doing, you guys are doing really great work because I don't think these kind of conversations existed before. And so it is, the numbers look high or, and, and maybe not so um, successful yet, but at least we're having those conversations because I think the pandemic has, that's an, a good outcome of the pandemic, that now everybody has seen the inequities on the screen and everything was unequal. <laughs> And so now every, every district nationally is having to really have these kind of tough conversations. So, um, so I think you all are doing amazing and trying to do everything to engage. But as far as retention, I think the retention is on all of us. You know, it can't be just one way 
um, that the teachers also need to hear this, get the support from their community, from their parents, you know, giving them, you know, uh, acknowledging them when, you know, hey, my son is doing better now, then thank you, or anything that our parents and community can do to let that teacher know Absolutely. that we really appreciate everything you're doing because we don't do it enough. <laughs> and, and so um, I, that will also be reinforcing what you all are doing, you know, but I think it, it needs to, we all need to own that. So I just uh, w wanted to share with you because like I said, uh, of these 30 years, I've never heard a lot of what you're doing and that because people, uh, teachers and staff, um, all staff, you know, they would feel like, oh, I can't say anything because I might get fired. Well, those days are gone, right? They're gone. It's important for people. I mean, this is where they live um, five days a week. And so it's uh, all of us creating that, that campus environment. It's going to look different, but it'll still, in, this, in a sense, be the same because you want the same expectation, that same culture, a relational culture that's going to, um, help teachers to feel, you know what, I'm, I'm, I feel respected, I feel heard, I feel part of this family, uh, as well as parents to be more engaged with the teachers and helping them do their part at home to support the student. So um, I just, I think y'all are going above and beyond and I think we continue doing that, that um, it's, gonna, it's gonna get better, I, I'm very hopeful. So thank you for all that you're doing. Um, also, I was thinking, you know, um, as, as we talk about how do we engage the, the parents and community, I mean, there's some programs that parents are participating and being successful in, like Padres Como Maestros, those are parents who really want to learn how to participate and help at the schools. Once they graduate, what do we do to help them continue to develop their leadership in, in the schools? And so that's, it's that one. There's also the, recently there was that group of um, the AISD champions. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we engage them and say, hey, you know, would you be interested? Uh, because again, it's, they, they, they uh, participated, graduated, and then what, <laughs> you know? So this could be the, and then what, <laughs> you know? So uh, I think you have some resources there that we just need to tap in and figure out how do we, uh, how do we help uh, the campuses uh, to Im improve uh, in this area. Um, uh, oh yeah, uh, the, I think the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, is the is Education Austin the only organization that teachers belong to? No, ma'am. There are others. We have, uh, we have teachers that belong to ACPTA and TCTA. Okay. So are they part of these conversations as well? Uh, Education Austin is um, our the entity which with we with which we have consultation, and so uh, again that was the entity at the table when when PPFT was built and has been with us along for the ride to this point. Well, uh, and I think we're we're that's hurting us because we're not hearing from all of them, and um, and I think we're at the point where we need to have everybody at the table. So. And, I would add part of our consultation agreement is we have three representatives of Education Austin on our committee, but we have nine teachers on the committee and we did survey them and we do have teachers that are members of other professional organizations outside of Education Austin. Um, it's just Education Austin gets a, a certain number of members of the oversight committee, but we do have teachers and administrators who are members of other professional organizations. Are they because uh, they the biggest organization of, of membership? Yes, ma'am. They are the biggest uh, membership organization on uh, NASD uh, by quite a few percentage points. Uh, we have, I believe, it's 21 percent. Uh, I don't have the data in right in front of me, but 21 percent of our teachers are Education Austin members. Okay. 
All right, I just, you know, I just, um, that's very helpful to know because I didn't know um, that, that some of those other teachers are representatives of the other organizations, so that it's inclusive of everyone that they can uh, know that they are being heard, that they all are all being treated with, res with respect. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think that was uh, my last question. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Yeah, thank you. I want to say thank you, um, both Ms. Hosek and Ms. Ortiz for the presentation, the information, um, and just for your honesty and, and real transparency that we're dealing with forces bigger than us and we're dealing with forces that we have control over um, and that we need to control those. So, uh, you know, and, and talking about the factors, I appreciate the Buck Foundation data, the national data about what people are looking for, appreciate knowing that often it does align when we talk about the need for people to be heard. What I hear when I'm hearing you guys speak is that people are being heard. And so I really appreciate that and I think that is an essential step. So I just want to start with that appreciation um, and that, that understanding that we are going deeper with panorama surveys with a lot to really dig deeper. Yes, ma'am. Um, and really want to make sure as we're doing that, that um, people not only feel heard, but people feel safe. And I continue to hear that people don't feel safe to speak and that there's work to be done there as well. And, and this conversation, this, you know, the work you're doing is a step toward that. So I um, just really want to share an appreciation with that. Um, and also the fact that you're acknowledging that um, teacher and staff issues are student issues. And that we, when teachers are telling us what they need, they're telling us for themselves and they're telling us for their students and, and that we're hearing that loud and clear. So thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions about the data. Um, the first is when you look at the middle school turnover for educators, it seems um, not universally, but pretty consistently higher at middle schools in our, our information that you've shared. And do you have a sense of why that is? It, it, I think it would be, um, conjecture probably for me to take guesses, but but middle school is hard. Middle school is hard for everybody. Yeah. Um, I have a sixth grader, and it's hard to be a parent of a sixth grader. So um, it's just such a it's such a, a huge upheaval from elementary life in, into and so, but it translates into into the supports that our teachers need for our students who are going through a tremendous. Um, um, you know, moment of maturity mm -hmm. and, and those needs and really developmentally um, what our students in middle school need. And so, but I think you have to take that and translate it into the supports that are necessary on those campuses. And so when we talk about, again, when we, when we talk again about budget and how we allocate resources, being more mindful of, of what those develop what is developmentally appropriate to have available on middle school campuses is something that we absolutely need to look at because just back to Trustee Singh's point, it will then fall on others to do that work who are not necessarily equipped to do that work. And and so that is absolutely a concern um, because we need to make sure that we are not overlooking that what is again developmentally appropriate uh, in terms of staffing. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think um, Dr. Mays isn't here and uh, President Rodriguez and, and Jacob, so I'll say it now and then I'll tell it again to them <laughs> and, and share it with my colleagues here. I think when we see higher teacher turnover at middle school, we see uh, we that's a time when we lose more students to charters and other yep. options, yes, um, that it is something that probably deserves some additional focus by the administration and the board and the community to really problem solve and, and probably the long range planning committee can have a role in that. So I appreciate you flagging that yes, um, as a more than just the numbers we're seeing on the page. Thank you for that. Um, talking about the campus support and the budget, I also want to be sure we're talking about um, teacher support and the staff support because we, we did see a drop this year and I, I hope this is um, we're on the path to turning that around, but um, I'm hearing anecdotally from campuses 
that some of the central office cuts that were made to balance the, bu the budget, the less behavioral support, less instructional support, less library support, is really being felt on campuses. And I, I really would love to get a better sense of whether what I'm hearing are blips or whether that's more universal and whether we might want to look at some budget amendments mid-year to restore some of that so we aren't um, continuing to churn with that, with that loss of teachers. So I'll be interested to see what the survey shows and, and what we're hearing about that. But that is something I am hearing pretty consistently from, from a lot of directions, and um, that that's really being felt, um, and especially felt uh, on campuses with a lot of first-year teachers, where that's also, um, you know, just those teachers need extra support and colleagues are stepping in in addition to all their other duties. And when we talk about, you know, adding work um, yes, you know, and what we can take away, that, that's um, one of the things I'm hearing. Um, and then uh, staffing the same thing, I think um, we're hearing, you know, we saw our, our staff numbers dip as well. I know the custodians, uh, there were a lot of changes to save money, and I think that's being felt very strongly by people right now from what I'm hearing. So really just looking as we go into budgeting, um, I would love help from you guys about what we're, we're hearing. Um, and then also just want to let our community know that there is advocacy being done at the legislature, that we can manage our own budget as well as we can, and um, we're the bottom 10 in per student funding in the country, and, and real advocacy at the legislature is needed to pay teachers what they deserve. And I think, you know, we're never going to be able to pay them enough, but we <laughs> need to pay them more. Yes. Um, and while we're on the path to that, I really appreciate this focus on hearing and acting in ways that, that give some of that control and agency back to teachers to help us drive the district So and, and their own working conditions. Because when teachers are talking again, they're, we know they're talking about what's best for their students as well. So thank you for all of this. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Justine. Well, thank you, trustees, and thank you, Dr. Mays. As part of our commitment to monitoring, the last question is to ask if trustees accept the report presented as it aligns with their goals and constraints, and if not, to ask if this is still the right strategy for the district. Trustees, please raise your right hand if you're ready to accept tonight's report. Thank you, trustees, for taking part in the shared commitment to students and student outcomes. Thank you. Um, trustees, we're, we're now going to move on to our information, reports, and updates. Uh, Dr. Mays, would you please introduce the next item on uh, dual language implementation report? Yes, sir. Thank you. Austin ISD is committed to continuous improvement uh, and to support the needs of our students. Uh, as a result, the MET team that's making their way up will share a recent program evaluation hosted by Dr. Iscardo, who flew in to be with us tonight, uh, a third party expert. Similar to the Stetson report and the program evaluation, it will serve as a guide to, for the necessary improvements in conjunction with our dual language stakeholders. I am committed to ensuring the fidelity and implementation of addressing equity through our district leadership. We are currently integrating efforts to ensure best practices for all students, especially within our special education student populations and language programs. Our students deserve the best outcomes, and we are committed to providing the supports to ensure each student reaches their potential. And so uh, thank you again, Dr. Izquierdo, for flying in to be here with us tonight. Uh, thank you to the MET team uh, for digging into the work and looking for some of our hurdles and barriers uh, and being productive and working with stakeholders to eliminate them. So I'll turn it over to the team, uh, Ms. Casas, uh, and the rest of the team. Thank you. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Mays. Um, we're here tonight to give you an update on our dual language program. At the end of March, we presented on the status of dual language and some of our student outcomes, and we shared with the board that we were contracting with Dr. Izquierdo to do a program evaluation. So today, we're going to talk about the findings and our next steps. So here with me today, I have Dr. Villapando, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Student Programs. We have 
uh, Dr. Izquierdo. We have Dr. Cody Fernandez, who is director over secondary programs, and Yvette um, Cardenas, who's a director for elementary programming. And so Dr. Izquierdo is a linguist by trade. She holds a PhD in applied linguistics and bilingual education from Georgetown University in Washington. She served as a principal of the first national dual language bilingual education model in the country in Washington, DC. She's been the director of bilingual ESL education. She continues to guide and collaborate with districts across the state in implementing district-wide dual language programs. Dr. Izquierdo's expertise, research, and experience are in the areas of leadership in dual language, bilingual education, biliteracy, transforming schooling ideologies and practices for emergent bilingual student. Her current book publication is, entitled, is titled uh, Dual Language Education, Teaching and Leading Through Two Languages. So we're excited to have her here with us tonight and for the work that she's done with our team. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Villapando. Thank you, good evening. Thank you for having us this evening. We just wanted to start with some of the benefits of bilingualism. So one of the things that we've been working on is really implementing um, the program to, to Fidelity and kind of doing a refresh and a reset. And in doing so, really focusing on why, the why. Why is bilingualism important? And so, one second. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about is kind of the history of the Bilingual Education Act in Texas. And uh, one of the things that we've been reminding uh, our staff and our leadership as we talk about bilingualism is the fact that in the 1970s, when the Bilingual Education Act began in Texas, uh, the intent of the program is much different than it's evolved to today. So at that time, uh, we were given funds uh, from the state, school districts were given funds to ensure that students who spoke a second language learned English quickly and transitioned quickly. So over time, um, we think about our current state and where we're at, uh, you know, with the pandemic, and we, you know, we look at um, the last legislative legislative session in which there was funding provided for the two-way dual language program. So at this point, really looking at um, how are we doing with bilingualism and why? So with the pandemic, that's caused a more global economy. And in doing so, what we found in some of the research was that more than half of the world's population knows more than one language. And so if we continue uh, to educate in the same way that we were educated, we're not gonna prepare our students and they won't uh, be able to compete in a global economy. So definitely uh, there's economic advantages to bilingualism. There's preparing our students, but of course there's cultural and social advantages. And what we found, uh, what was interesting, um, was that there's a delayed development or increased resistance to dementia. That's one of the benefits of bilingualism. Um, that also uh, there are studies where there's toddlers who have two languages spoken within the home and when they uh, scan their brain activity, they could see that there was higher executive functioning. So over time, uh, there are true benefits to bilingualism and it's really the way uh, to do business now and to really prepare our students for the future. We showed you this model um, in previous uh, presentations, and so just want to make note that if you look at this, you look at the different models that a student uh, can participate in uh, for language and learning a second language, the best model uh, through research is the two-way model. It shows that if you look at that highest line, that is the two-way uh, dual language model, and the average student of a monolingual student is at the 50th percentile, and it shows that over time, the two-way model uh, surpasses all others as far as academic achievement and, and cognitive ability. In Austin, um, one of the things that we've looked at, uh, of course, in previous presentations has been the outcomes. So when we look at where uh, the district average for all grade levels is at, compared to where our emergent bilingual students uh, have performed, we definitely want to make sure that that gap is eliminated uh, and that the model truly shows what the research says and that there should be high levels of sustained academic performance. 
Good evening. I'm going to share just a little bit of the history of dual language in Austin ISD. You can see from this slide that it began in 2010. Um, and through the process of dual language, we started with a sequential model, meaning that our students uh, were learning one language, they were learning literacy in one language first, and then adding on another language. Um, we now have a simultaneous by literacy model, it's a 90-10 model. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but that's kind of the, the overview. Next slide. And so you can see on this slide, those are the numbers of our campuses that currently offer dual language. You can see that we have also, in addition to Spanish, we have Mandarin and Vietnamese dual language at elementary, and 12 middle schools and high schools that are offering Spanish dual language. Um, currently, uh, just to point out the difference between one-way and two-way, really the primary difference between those two programs are the students that are that are sitting in the classroom. Um, instructionally, they are 90-10 model, simultaneous bilingual, like our two, so two-way and, and one-way are the same. And so it's important to note that Austin ISD is a multilingual district uh, and the evidence is, is right here up on this slide. So um, we've shared before that 30 of our students last year graduated with the Austin uh, dual language seal of biliteracy, and that means that those students went through the dual language program all the way to 12th grade. But what may not be have been shared was that we had 1,922 students that graduated with the uh, performance acknowledgement in bilingualism and biliteracy. And so what that means is that those students selected to go beyond the minimum requirement of two world language credits, LOAT credits, that are required for graduation and decided to go ahead and continue continue their studies into a more advanced level. Um, and so I, that's a perfect example of the value that's placed within this district and community on multilingualism and bilingualism. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening, Board President Rodriguez and Interim Superintendent Dr. Mays and other trustees on the board. It's my pleasure to be here today to share a passion of that I have and that's dual language. And I really appreciate what uh, Dr. Vigalpando just said right now in terms of, you know, the dual language program was initially developed for emergent bilinguals, right? So that they could access the full curriculum. And I have to be one of those back in the early 80s, right? I've been dueling it for 100 years already before it was cool, before dual was cool. And um, my students were achieving above the national norm in both languages, all right? They didn't know what I did in the school. I was known as the little Hispanic principal that taught Spanish, all right? But when the scores came out, that was a different story. So all of the ingredients were there, all right? And it was working. I'm talking about a school. You all are living a, hill, a whole district. So I understand it gets a lot, a lot more complicated right now. So I do want to say that when there was a lot of growth on um, emergent bilinguals and they started scoring very well, my English speaking population when I was principal were then knocking on my door and saying, we want our kids to be a part of this. And so we started two way. All right, and so we started two way. And right now in your district, you've got one way and you've got two way. And both programs are supposed to be equally good. They're supposed to be rich in their curriculum. They're supposed to have the three goals, which are bilingualism, biliteracy, high academic achievement through two languages, and positive cross cultural attitudes. And so they should be good across the board. So I did the study. I was, I, was, I was commissioned to come and do the study here. And I want to start with, first of all, letting you know that dual language is inclusive. It's an inclusive program and it's equity driven by design, all right? All languages, all cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, everything. So equity is a big piece of dual language education. And so with that in mind, I wanna tell you that in doing this study, I did a survey district wide to all elementary, middle, and high school teachers that have anything to do with dual language, to elementary and secondary and middle school uh, principals just as well. So I did a cross-district survey on that, asking them about their awareness of the 90-10, uh, any challenges that they saw you know, in terms of moving to a 90-10, uh, how they perceived um, being uh, faithful, fidelity, 
to the model or what kept them from being faithful to the model. In addition to that, I had many focus groups. Um, I did three focus groups, three separate focus groups of uh, principals, elementary and secondary. Uh, three of teachers, elementary and secondary. Two focus groups of the, of the Multicultural Education Advisory Committee, the, the, the MIEC, MIEC, is that right? Yeah, okay. Community members, two of those. I did one focus group of the Austin ISD Office of Leadership and Academics team. I did four different focus group sessions with parents in Spanish and in English. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do one focus group of the first graduating seniors in dual language bilingual education um, who graduated with a seal of biliteracy. So you see the complexities in the early grades, but then you see what they can achieve, right, when they're already moving up to high school. I also conducted 12 campus visits, all right, 12 campus visits. So collectively, all of this gave me a lot of data. Um, and interestingly enough, the same kinds of challenges were identified in every group at every level. And so I would like to present some of those to you today. As you can see here, we're gonna talk about the findings have to do with implementation. Implementation is everything. When we say implementations, many times the first people we think about is the teacher, that she's not implementing that well with fidelity in the classroom. It's a lot more than that. A teacher cannot implement well if she doesn't have the leadership on the campus that can support her and mentor her. A teacher cannot work well if she doesn't have the resources that she's supposed to use. And in dual language, it's gonna be in English and Spanish. Everything, equity across the board, remember that. And in dual language, it's important that your principals also are supported by their, uh, well, as you can see the, on, on the list on, on the slide there, you know, by their executive directors or directors which means that they need to know about dual language education also so that they can support campus administrators and hold them accountable, and hold them accountable, right, to dual language implementation and the promises of dual language uh, bilingual education. The assistant and associate superintendents need to hold their executive directors and directors accountable to make sure that they are working with their principals. The chiefs have to know about it so that they can advocate and support everything that has to do with dual language across the district. And of course, our superintendent, it has to come from him. His leadership and, and, and what he says is extremely important. So the point made here is that implementation is not effective if everybody here on that list that you see there is not on board. And by being on board, I mean that they understand what dual language is first and foremost. It is not a program that pushes English because the more English you learn, the better you're going to do. And that's not true, that's, that's a myth. We know now, and research has shown us that the more the student uses his primary language along with English, the more connections they're gonna make and the more proficient and faster they're gonna learn English, but the learning that takes place is what dual language does. Dual language isn't about learning another language. Dual language is about learning in two languages. High ac academic achievement and critical thinking across the board. So that's very important as part of implementation that everybody's on board. And findings is that that's what we need. We don't have those connections solidified, all right? And we need to develop that knowledge base in many of our employees here in, in this um, arena of dual language. The other piece of implementation is program structure, and that's one of the most important pieces of dual language large scale. Large scale means that you're doing it across the district. And one of the reasons we go large scale is that we're able to catch more students, to be able to provide more students the opportunity of learning in dual language. So in program structure, in order for me to lead it, in order for me to support it, I really need to know what it is. I need to know about dual language education, the goals, and what the research says. There has to be clarity about the model that's going to be used. And as you saw by the presentation, they went from 50-50 to 80-20 with three options in that 80-20, and then finally we moved to 90-10. And it wasn't done haphazardly, though. We need to get credit to the people that were in place and that are in place now. Every switch that was made was done with the intent to improve it. There were committees of teachers, there were principals that had charlas, which means conversations, all right, that met. There were eighth graders that were given a survey and interviewed way back, all right, in uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. And these reports are your reports, internal reports here to, AI, to AISD, so I, I looked at those. So since then, 
they have been giving input, right, to move the agenda forward for dual language and to make accommodations. The reason they went to 80-20 is because many teachers said they needed more time in Spanish so that the children could learn more while they were learning English. That's one of the reasons that they did that. And so um, the allocation plan has to be known also, and that means what is taught in English and how much time is taught in English. Bottom line is that uh, the dual language program in AISD reaches a 50-50 model, meaning that 50% of the day, right, or 50% of the curriculum is in Spanish and 50% is in English. That's what they go to. They start at 90-10, but they get to 50-50 by, by third grade. So do people understand that? And I asked teachers that and principals that through the survey, through our interviews that we had, parents and everything. And also understanding what we mean by simultaneous biliteracy. Right now, I, I believe, uh, Dr. Fernandez, right? She mentioned um, the, uh, si the sequential biliteracy, which means that children learn how to read in Spanish first, and after that, they move into reading in English, right? Well, the new model, 9010, really promotes and asks for understanding simultaneous biliteracy. That means that your children and my children learn how to read in both languages in kinder in kindergarten. That requires a real specialization of teachers and professional development across the board so that they understand how to do it. Because parents will say, are they gonna get confused? Are they gonna get behind? Are they? No, they don't. When they know what they're doing, when they, have, they receive the proper professional development. And last, but certainly not least, is being f uh, faithful, right? Fidelity to the model. Faithful means that you're going to do to do it all the time, implement it all the time, and you're gonna implement it the same way across the board. Because this allows you as a district to measure the progress across the board, and before you couldn't do that, because there was too much flexibility before, in an effort, right, to streamline it and make it better. But this is the program structure. So as a district, as, as chiefs, associate superintendents, executive directors, campus administrators, teachers, do we know what dual language is? Do we know the goals? Do we know what the research says? Do we understand, is it clear that we're doing 90-10 and what does that mean to me as a kindergarten teacher or as a fourth grade teacher or as a middle school teacher? Do we understand how to develop simultaneous biliteracy and are we practicing it? And once again, going to the left side of the slide, if that leadership, right, is not informed, then it's really hard to hold anybody else accountable. All right, so that was a huge finding that was made there. Um, the next slide, if you can take it to the next slides, is dual language program finding reviews also was the issue of equity and access that was brought forth by many of the community members and parents, all right? Equity and access, which is, which is kind of interesting because dual language is equity driven, all right? Yet the program was not accessible to everyone. In communities of low socioeconomic and of color, right, you found less quality in the program model. You found the one-way model, which is perceived as something less, but it should be equal to the two-way model, all right? There were lack of quality programs, inconsistent implementation, and you still had transitional models, the old model of bilingual education, uh, that were, that are, that did already, right, transition out of transition, and now started implementing dual language education. But this is a finding that a lot of the community members and parents uh, provided input on, that they saw that they perceived that it was not equitable across the board. Those are the biggest findings that I have there. Now understand that in the leadership and program implementation, if I'm talking about uh, uh, simultaneous biliteracy, then I need to look at materials and resources and professional development and assessments through both languages. If my goal is academic achievement in both languages, then that means I have to be assessing through both languages. Austin ISD has had, what, 12 to 13 years we're going now of implementing dual language, and it's, it's really amazing, the progress that it's made. Messy, yes, because we're, we're at different places, and that's why we need to reset, recommit, right, and go back into professional development across the board so that we can provide students, all students, this wonderful opportunity of achieving through two languages. So I'm going to stop at this point and let... Um, is it you, Ms. Gasser? Next. All right. And I'll okay, thank you, Dr. Izquierdo. Um, thank you for all of that information and for your work and for really listening to our stakeholders because the most important thing is that you heard from the community, including students so, and teachers. So thank you. Um, so our team has really 
aggressively taken this information um, and started to try to really change uh, our systems and processes that we have here. And we find that the greatest way uh, to provide that equity and access is to start really communicating internally and trying to embed um, work between departments and programs and groups. And so in working through uh, Chief Casas, we've really been able to access principles um, through the uh, development uh, processes that we have and really embedding every program um, so that uh, principals can learn how to truly support teachers. So one of the first things that we need to do is to really audit the dual language curriculum and to really ensure that the resources that we have uh, available for our campuses are sufficient and they're um, up to date. Um, really communicating that dual language is for everyone and making sure that that's truly a possibility. So one of the things that we've done is we submitted a survey uh, that had already been developed and kind of um, we revisited it and we were able to send that to the community at large, even uh, larger than the school district parents and uh, community members and caregivers. Um, so we have some information about knowledge and interest throughout the city. We uh, recruited more, um, tried to recruit more representation to the MEAC committee and held a session for parents, which was very successful about the importance of bilingualism and biliteracy. So we had host sessions throughout the district where we had parent engagement specialists interacting uh, virtually and in person. And so we would go to different parts of the city and we had Dr. Medina um, present uh, to really show the importance of being um, bilingual and um, respecting cultures, multiple cultures. Also um, engaging with emergent bilingual families and getting to the root of um, communication and, and how to best do that. Also, uh, we've developed some parent toolkits and um, a readiness assessment, and I'm gonna explain some of those processes for looking at anything that we develop. Looking from um, one ways to two ways and how to best do that equitably. Um, looking at the courses, you know, some of the feedback that we got earlier on was looking at the courses throughout the district and how can we truly have a path uh, for a student at every level. And we found that definitely there's some, uh, some work to be done in working with curriculum, looking at uh, uh, course guides at second, the secondary level to be sure that they're aligned. So as we've grown, through, um, which is great and it's commendable, how do we kind of reset and make sure that what we have out there really works for our families and for our students? Um, so we definitely took the feedback from that and we're starting to work on it. But again, I think the biggest thing that we're doing is embedding professional learning. So one of the first things we did was we met with Brandy Hosack and the professional development team to look at how do we embed every special population within the development that's out there for at every level. Um, we're also working within academics. We're working within every department. Um, even our uh, advanced academics team and early learning teams are looking at um, bilingualism. We really started to have more of an intentional focus with uh, school leadership. The Office of School Leadership, we've conducted learning walks. We're looking at uh, a checklist for implementation purposes. But what we're doing is we're utilizing the MEAC committee. We've extended some of the meetings to include more of uh, work sessions so that we're hearing and working and coming up with suggestions and uh, proposals through that committee. We will also have an, uh, a district task force of district leaders and teachers and um, uh, potentially students to look at, okay, now that these are some of the suggestions, how do we see that that's gonna work within the district? Is this doable? Is it something that's acceptable uh, from their lens? And then again, I think the biggest thing that we can do is work together and integrate what we do as a district um, so that we're not uh, working in different departments or, or silos. Um, some of the implications um, of really resetting that 90-10 is we're gonna have to look at our policies to see if they're up to date. So we may come back to you with some policy revisions that we're looking at uh, with community stakeholders. Um, also a stipend review to be sure that what we expect um, and that was something that uh, Dr. Izquierdo mentioned in her report, 
uh, is that how, what are some things that we can require uh, to be sure that there is a consistency of support. So looking at the area stipends for dual language and what's the policy in the neighboring districts and like districts, and then how do we vet that within our community to make sure that it's doable here in the Austin ISD and it's acceptable um, and doesn't add um, to anyone's plate more than we need to. Um, so that's kind of some of the things that we're working on and where we're at. So good evening and thank you for this opportunity. Obviously we're very excited about dual language and I know you are too. So um, one thing I wanna add is looking at this timeline, obviously we're working on a lot of things um, and we're very grateful for the opportunity. One really important part is working with our stakeholders, working with the community. Um, we've been very fortunate, very blessed to have our supporters from the community. Um, which are, we're now working with on the MEAC, the Multilingual Education Advisory Committee, um, the African American Dual Language Committee, the Coalition for Bilingual Education Committee, um, the Overton Group, um, the even ABE, right, the Austin Area Association of Bilingual Education. So we're really excited about all of those opportunities as we move forward in this timeline. So we have a video for you and just also wanted to add in, um, you know, we, we know we're gonna leave somebody out. So just want to definitely thank uh, our partners, all of them. And we know Vela and Avance are also some of our partners that work with us in the United Way. to pecan springs three of them do i have four sons they go to pecan springs three of them do uh, one is coming in august and three of them are a part of the dual language program i chose dual language because i really want my boys to have every advantage that they can have in life i love to teach spanish to my students i have been at pecan Springs for five years teaching pre-k Es beneficial para los estudiantes afroamericanos aprender español y aprender a uh, la comunidad hispana. Because estamos aquí en este estado de Texas, donde la mitad o la mayoría hablan español y la otra mitad habla inglés. Creo que es muy beneficial para los estudiantes aprender ambos idiomas para cuando vayan a, afuera a buscar empleos o a tratar de comunicarse con otras personas puedan hacerlo en ambos idiomas. I love reading and writing. Me gusta leer y escribir. The the fact that we have the opportunity to meet with the cohort of people that we've been growing up with and it really helps us um, develop your identity and learn so much about different cultures and stuff like that. I really don't see it in any other program. My perspective of learning a language is not simply of learning the grammar, the definitions of a language. You also tend to learn the culture behind it, tra traditions. My name is Brooke Maudlin. I'm a Spanish teacher at Aikens High School. The program goals are for the students to achieve high academic achievement. We're giving them rigorous classes in English and Spanish. The second goal of our program is bilingualism and biliteracy. And then the third is cross-cultural competency. El programa del lenguaje dual me ha ayudado en seguir en mis estudios enfocados y también ver opciones de como uh, educación más alto. So it's really setting them up for success uh, in Austin ISD, honoring their culture, providing information and resources in both languages so the parents can be more engaged. Overall, I think the community is going to benefit as a whole. And then many of our kids are staying in Austin. They're going to universities here and they're coming back to work in the community. Mi, mi sueño en el futuro es ser una influencia al mundo, este, abrir compañías y poder ayudar y dar para atrás a las comunidades y ayudar a fundar programas que ayuden a más alumnos. Once I fully learn Spanish, it's going to help me for people who don't speak 
English and only Spanish so I could talk to them. The dual language program has really helped me f find my identity. I'd say as a high school student, we all struggle to find who we are. And being able to partake in this beautiful program has really helped me figure out that I'm not just an American or a Mexican, I am a Mexican-American. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. So thank you to the team. Um, I think one of the things that we've realized throughout this process is that uh, we really do have to address um, some of the expectations around training uh, for principals, teachers, assistant principals, uh, and executive leaders in order to make sure that we have um, implementation with fidelity uh, and consist consistency across our district. And so that is something that is a major area of focus for the team uh, so that we can get it right and get the outcomes that we, you know, we know that these students should be able to accomplish pretty consistently across mm -hmm. our district. So. Thank you, Dr. Mays. Trustees, um, any questions? Trustee Boswell. Um, yes, thank you all for this information, for the study, and, and for sharing a window into what you're doing with all the findings. I appreciate it, uh, and really appreciate the celebration of how far we've come and the commitment to really make sure we're polishing and perfecting and making it um, even better than it is, what we know we can be. And just want to say an appreciation again for um, the Thomson Collier slide, which we see again and again, and for looking at the achievement gaps and, and not seeing that as a reason to walk away, but as a reason to really dig in and do it right and do it well. So just want to share that appreciation um, every time you bring that to us. Thank you. Because um, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, and, and really just want to um, also share an appreciation to our community um, for sharing their time and their knowledge and their passion for this. And, and it's gratifying to see that the work that's being done and the findings of the study really validate what people have been telling us for a long time. So that's powerful and uh, I'm glad to see that it's aligned and, and moving in a direction together with everybody. So thank you for that. Um, I have one question about, um, oh, and I also wanna say thank you, um, Dr. Viapunda for acknowledging the need for those people who aren't going to a dual language high school. We have many paths um, and, and kind of looking at those gaps too. So we're serving those students need to continue a language even if they're not continuing with that program. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question. We got the, we had a call at the beginning of the meeting about um, limiting instruction in the target language when you get closer to standardized testing. Um, and that's something we've certainly heard in the past. And I'm wondering um, to what degree does that state test pressure, especially at our most vulnerable campuses where we are seeing less fidelity um, play into what we're seeing? And what's the plan for really talking about that and addressing that in a way that serves our students and, and sticks with what we know is best? So I'm gonna start and then I'll let our expert chime in. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest areas that we need to address just with everybody in general is the belief systems around dual language. Um, I think that because our schools think, well, they're gonna test in middle school only in English, so let's hurry up and get them in English and teach them more English. Um, but our telpass data reflects that that's not, the, that's not the path forward because our students aren't performing. And as we look at our own internal data for student performance, we see that it doesn't match the Thomas and Collier your chart yet, and I'm gonna say yet because the goal is we will get there mm -hmm. um, through implementation. And so it's educating everybody to understand the, 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 the use of teaching in Spanish at the rigorous on grade level will help us get to the English academic language quicker if we really do it correctly instead of hurry up, let's do more English so that we can have better English outcomes because that's not gonna get us there. So I think it's educating the whole system to understand the benefits. Um, when we look at the number of, uh, the percent of students testing in Spanish from third to fifth grade, it's still 30 percentage. So I think our schools still are are not understanding that testing them in Spanish students can demonstrate the skills that they know, the knowledge and skills in the native language as they're building their English academic language. So it is the system of really educating people and for them to understand the benefits of Spanish and how that translate into higher English outcomes in the long run. Dr. Esquerdo, would you add anything? I was gonna say that. Oh. I was gonna say that this is not an uncommon issue. 
all right, across many districts. And basically it's because they, we don't understand dual language ENEP, we don't trust it, right? We're looking at it through an English lens is what we're doing. Dual language is looking at it through two lenses right there. So I wanna go back a little bit and talk about policy. Uh, you all mentioned policy. Well, that's why we need to revisit policy and revise it. It's, there should be policy in place that addresses that. When you have policy, they're going to grow your program better and you're going to be able to sustain the program. And after 12, 13 years of all time, effort and funds that have gone into dual language, you don't want it to fall apart, but we do need guidelines. And so everybody's gonna do what they think is best. And taking it in English is more of a compliance check mark for an, English, for an emergent bilingual. It's a compliance check mark, but all you're doing is testing his language proficiency. We really want to know what he knows, right? And so you need to make those kinds of, take those kinds of considerations uh, and when you decide what language we can use. And we're very fortunate in Texas that we have the curriculum in two languages. Most states don't have that. So we do, and we also have the, the opportunity to test them in English or Spanish. So that's another policy issue and conversation that has to be taken so that schools are guided more and not, we just don't leave it up to schools to decide because they're going to decide according to what they think is best, okay? Thank you for that, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, also just we'll look forward to hearing more about how um, the work with partners and families to really, and the task force to amplify awareness of the programs in all of our communities to really, so I just look forward to hearing more about what that looks like and where that's going as it comes into focus. So thank you for all of that. Thank you, trustees. Other questions? Trustee Zapata. I have a comment. So um, I think y'all are doing amazing. Um, and I think hearing the last student, you know, that it's not just learning the language, it's really appreciating, respecting their own culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many students who refuse to talk because they don't want to, they're ashamed of how, you know, their language. And I have talked to so many parents that has said, my son tells me not to speak Spanish to him at school, you know. So I think it's an opportunity to also, what can these students do in the campuses to, um, you know, to lift up that that's a good thing. Being bilingual is a good thing, and so that it, uh, it'll help others to begin to really appreciate that they're uh, bilingual. Uh, but that is a big stigma, and uh, I think having the diversity in these classes is, is, is great. Thank you. Um, Trustee Anderson and then Trustee Singh. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, one question, um, when was the last time an audit was done of dual language that you can, that you are able to find if there's? Are you asking prior to Dr. Esquerdo doing the program audit? Or that do you know? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think most of the team is brand new, um, so I, I don't, I don't know. But I did review. I did review. Some of the reports for the district that there had been evaluations done, right, for the first year and the second year, just to see how people were working with dual language and where they were. That was done. My request is a audit soon, soon rather than later. Thank you. Does he say? Um, thank you so much uh, for flying all the way in <laughs> to do this uh, presentation. This is something that I think many in our community have been waiting for for a long time. Um, so thank you, Dr. Mays, for making this happen. Um, so I think one of the key questions I have, you know, like when we when we um, adopted our dual language and bilingual education policy back in 2020, it was like such a major accomplishment and we never got a chance to really now do it, but now I feel like, okay, we're getting our footing um, after COVID and with your report, we definitely have more of a framework. But I think my question might be for Dr. Mays and any, anyone else is, how are you going to assess the fidelity of implementation? So we go back to my initial statement. <laughs> You know, we have to provide the training to the principals. We got to provide it to the EDs, all of the executive directors, uh, because 
I mean, again, you can't inspect what you don't know. <laughs> you can't mm -hmm. inspect what you don't understand. You can't coach what you don't know. You can't coach mm -hmm. what you don't understand. And so uh, the, the training expectations that we have to address systemically has to happen mm -hmm. in order for us to actually see is, it ha is the model actually being executed with fidelity. Uh, I think that we all understand that that's a significant lift, uh, but it has to happen. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're going to keep seeing kind of uneven results uh, as it relates to, you know, somebody over here knows the model really, really well, and they execute with mm -hmm. a high level of fidelity. Somebody over there may not know or may have this distrust <laughs> issue mm -hmm. uh, and may, you know, mm -hmm. lean towards testing a student in English versus in the uh, native tongue. And so just really trying to make sure that we're providing more support uh, for the entire system to be able to to execute with fidelity, but I appreciate yeah, that. That's a big lift. So I think what what would be helpful to me, like I know that you've listed all those campuses that have the dual language program, and so I think what I would love, and I don't know if you guys are doing this already, but when I think about like, okay, we can we if, let's say we use this here as a sort of a baseline before we've done all the training and everything, you know, could, is there a way? to establish sort of a baseline for all of our campuses, like a rubric or something that says, okay, you're level one through five or whatever, in terms of staffing, in terms of materials, in terms of X, Y, Z, um, and then actually in terms of implementation. So that way, once you do the training and all of that, we can see the growth and the fidelity of implementation. Because what I worry is if we're not measuring the baseline, like with numbers on the, like where we are with implementation, then we're not really going to be able to know how, like, where our efforts are really, like, where we're plugging in the holes. And it helps me as a trustee who approves budgets to know then, okay, well, it looks like staffing is where we have the biggest weakness, so I want to make sure we're putting money into staffing versus, oh, no, it's, in, it's materials, so now we need to make sure it's material. You know, so that's kind of the link I make to the governance thing. So um, That is a part of the work that they're doing now in terms of, assessing and auditing those pieces the materials the staffing that's stuff that they're engaged in right now and will we be getting that for each campus kind of like are you guys doing the campus by campus so level? we are we're look to ea has a bunch of rubrics out there and so we're trying to customize them to austin isd to what we expect to see and then from there we can tier the campuses based on how they're rating on the different categories um okay. I don't know how soon we can get that done, but we are, that is a, an intent because we need to know where their starting point is at every school. And because okay. some schools were phasing out their late exit transitional programs, so they may be at fourth grade and fifth grade. And so we are kind of, um, mm -hmm. there's a wide gamut. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to, I mean, it could take a yeah. year to do that. I mean, yeah. like it's a lot what you're talking about here. And so um, I'm not saying I'm just, I'm not in a rush. I mean, you know, I am in a rush, but it's not, I know right. we've, I just would love to know that you are doing it um, and you know if you have a sense of when that report might be ready um, I, I guess I would request that we kind of put that as an agenda request for whenever you think that might be ready and then we can I think for us it's also making sure that we educate the whole system the list of the leadership so that every role understands what it is mm -hmm. it's because because there's been such inconsistency um, in how it's implemented and um, the transition from the 80-20 with all the different variations to 90-10, like now mm -hmm. that we have one model, then yeah. everybody needs to understand what that means and making sure that the campuses know what that looks like, what does that sound like in the classroom so that as we walk schools, we don't wanna do a, an I gotcha, you know, That's so that right. schools don't feel like they're being penalized if they didn't know any better, they're doing the best that they can. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's really making sure that everybody is educated and un understands what it should look like. And then going step by step to make sure that where is each school and what is the need to get them to where they need to be. That's great. And I would, I would hope that this is part of the discussions on the um, campus advisory councils as well. Um, I don't know if this ever makes it to like the campus improvement plans. Um, you know, the f full implementation, but I, I would love, you know, is that something you guys are doing? Is it, is it part of the campus improvement plans? Or? So campuses do have implementation plans, is that correct? No, the campus improvement plan would be like overall strategies. I, I don't know that it would be specific to dual language. I don't know. I think Mr. Hicks is making his way Mr. Up. Hicks, I don't know. Cody, do you mind getting up soon? Yeah. We'll have 
Mr. Hicks, our elementary expert. <laughs> Hello. 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 Uh, so, yeah, the implementation is, uh, there, there are pieces of the uh, campus improvement plan do include information about dual language, but in general, it's, it's really about, at the beginning of the year, the training that we do and the, the executive director's really following through with um, visits to the schools and, and the learning walks, the dual language portion of that is really important to us, and so members of the team participate in those, and then we just continue the conversation throughout the year. I'm looking forward to the checklist that's being developed, and that will mm -hmm. help us and then your idea trustee seeing about having the, the baseline rubric and then being able to work from that is something that's um, exciting as well okay cool that'll be great yeah I think eventually like that would be really interesting because when I when I'm reading through some of the ant like the comments that people wrote in mm -hmm. it kind of points to like it's there's like a systemic change that needs mm -hmm. to happen it's just not this teacher needs to right. learn how to do it it's mm -hmm. like we have to build a whole system that supports mm -hmm. this like if you have two teachers and one you know like that might not be enough teachers or you might not have enough students to do a dual language program in certain schools mm -hmm. like you might not have enough english speakers or you know whatever and so i think that's kind of where i'm going with this is however you however we do this i mean i in my mind as a former like CAC member, like, I'm like, oh, that might be a one way, but you know, whatever, that's kind of what I'm thinking is like, how do we move this so that's a broader conversation beyond just the dual language teachers? So, thank you. So, this is one of those things, like you said, um, dual language being something that's going to take us a while to kind of address it. And so, we know that, like you said, it's not a one year fix, but like we said, that Dr. Iscardo has provided us with a roadmap uh, so that we can phase in uh, some of the supports and changes. Um, so it's going to be something that's, that takes place over multiple years. Sorry, thank you. If you scared me, okay. <laughs> if I may respond to Ms. Singh, that's a great question that you asked. Because when we do learning walks, sometimes we just look at the visual, what's there, the right? We look at the environment and we think, okay, everything's up. But if you look at the guiding principles for dual language, which are national principles, which I had a part, a role in in reviewing them, you see that they're broken up into different factions. So first we look at program structure. How is the school with program structure? Are they following the model? Do they believe in it? Are they attending professional development? We look at that. The next thing we look at is curriculum. What does the curriculum look like? Is there equity there? Is everything available, right? Biliteracy is huge here. You really have to know your reading through two languages to understand that. The next thing we look at is instruction. Does the teacher know how to make instruction comprehensible in a language that the child doesn't speak? And it goes both ways in a two-way. You've got your English speaker learning Spanish and your Spanish speaker learning English. So it works both ways. And then we look at assessment. What are the assessments that are done? Informal assessments and formal assessments, right? And state assessments, we're assessed out. We have to be a lot more thoughtful about how we use those assessments. And after assessment, then we look at professional development. So we're looking at maybe, and we had this conversation, in terms of trying to account for everyone who participates in professional development, so it's done digitally or something automatic by school. You can build capacity in your own campus by that, by knowing what teachers have attended what and what they need, you know, or as a district, you build your capacity there. And then we have family and community. You mentioned family and community and how important that is. How can we measure? that they are engaging family, that their numbers are increasing from your English-speaking population as well as your African-American population as where your, your Spanish population. Are those numbers increasing? Are we losing kids as they go up? And lastly, it's support and resources. And by support, I'm not talking about supporting teachers. I'm talking about supporting with funding that, that is allotted, right, to dual language education and resources. So it could be factioned out. Yeah, it's, it's I really complex. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And you guys, just sitting here and listening to all of this, it reminds me about like why I love AISD so much. <laughs> like seriously, we are going above and beyond. And I'm just so yes. proud of our district. You should be. It makes me think, you know, like I can't talk to my grandma because I don't speak the yeah. language. And if I, I feel like if I had, I mean, I can understand Gujarati, I can't speak it, but I feel like if I'd gone to a school that honored people's mm -hmm. cultures and languages like yes. AISD does, it would have been a very different mm -hmm. exactly. story. So thank you for this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support it. Um, I think I, I have a lot of 
questions, but I have a couple of comments. I think one of them is I think as my colleagues know, um, both of my grandmothers never saw the inside of a schoolhouse and I grew up speaking Spanish at home. So as a student, I really appreciate the focus on the bilingual, bicultural, biliteracy pieces and the work that you do, Dr. Esquerdo, across the country. So thank you for that. I think what your program review findings um, for me confirm some of the observations that we've made as a board that in some areas we don't have a school district, we have a district of schools and that we need to make sure that we're doing intentional system approaches that break down systems and that we create the ones we really want with the intentionality of the outcomes that, that we want. I think my, my, I guess my other comment, which is much more broader, is about board accountability. Um, you, you, um, and this is from a board member perspective, so, and from a governance perspective. There are, there are certain things that I think the board has asked for and has uh, an expectation around the, a prioritization of, of our bilingual education policy. And two questions. One, we changed our, we removed early exit because we had heard that from the community and from a lot of members that we needed to remove that, which we did. But are there any policy recommendations that your review found that we ought to be implementing? I think the other part is that as we continue to balance our budget, making sure that we have the bond programs to invest in our buildings for good working conditions for our teachers and learning environments for our students. It gives us the opportunity to be transformational, brave, in saying, okay, we have our financial house in order. What are the right priorities financially? And I think we've had some good collaboration with the administration, with our chief financial officer, with our superintendent, to prioritize three items to go deep dives in, in budgetary issues, and one of them happens to be dual, uh, dual language. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a good timing and opportunity to really be transformational about what policy recommendations we might have included with the community as well, what budget issues we have, and then what policy, well, policy, what funding issues we have, and how we hold ourselves as a board accountable to all of this, because I think that systems approach and intentionality of that, I think is gonna be really important for us to, to do. And, uh, and I, I'm really, uh, and I'm gonna be really selfish here and say that I'm really uh, glad that you highlighted the, the bilingual literacy I'm sorry, the seal of biliteracy, since those two schools happen to be in District 6, not that, and, and which happens to be part of the rest of the school district. But um, I really appreciate the, the hard work that's happening in those schools with those teachers and those staffs, because it is a, an entire team effort. Um, and I'm just really excited about what this creates as, as trustee things and the, the baseline for how we move forward with clarity and accountability uh, to us all. But, you know, I know there's embedded questions in that, but I also just wanted to share um, how grateful I am that we're focused on these issues and all the leadership that, that's here with us today. So Dr. Esquerdo did make some recommendations and I'll let her share them. And she gave us some samples of other district policies that we're gonna go back and compare to ours. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Esquerdo. Okay. Um, I helped other districts develop policy, but it, it requires everyone at the table. Everybody's been saying everyone at the table. We're gonna have everyone at the table for a lot of things, aren't we? But it's important that we decide how we're going to work with assessment in the district. So in one of the policies that I've written for a district, it says that all students in dual language education will be assessed through two languages. Of course, teachers are going to say, oh my God, we're gonna test more. Parents are gonna say, oh my God, we're gonna test more but they get creative. We just have to be a lot more thoughtful. For example, in one of the districts, they develop their own benchmarks and their own assessments. And half of the tests, let's say there's 20 items. I'm just making that up. 10 of them will be in English and 10 of them will be in Spanish. By fifth grade, they should be able to handle that because they've already gotten the content. They should be able to handle it in either one. It's not a translation or a repetition. It's a different question and children are able to do that. Then we're really looking at content development, academic development, and language development as it is. Another one has to do with professional development and making sure that every teacher, every new teacher goes through 12 hours of dual language training when they start. And after that, six hours every, every year that every principal goes through so many hours of training 
every year, right? That every administrator goes through. And so once again, documenting that, and the board goes through a whole weekend of training. How's that, right? <laughs> of training so that we're all on the same page and we understand what is happening. So those kinds of policies are important. What language are you gonna assess in uh, is a huge one. And then how we disaggregate data. One of the things that I did note in the report that it's hard to follow a student that's in dual language all the way to high school. We weren't really, and PEAMS didn't help us any before, I know, the state doesn't help us with that, but maybe I suggested internally, maybe we could do something here to code your English-speaking students that are in dual language and your emergent bilinguals that are in dual language and follow them to see in their trajectory how they are doing you know, across the board. Um, other policies had to do with materials and resources that have to be available in both languages. Before, in old bilingual days, all right, Everything was translated. So the good copies were in English, and then the not so good looking copies were translated in Spanish. So that was an indirect message for kids and for teachers too. But now we have an abundance of resources. Now we have to be really smart and thoughtful about which ones we select. But it's there, so understanding that the support from the board and for funding has got to be for materials in both languages. Quality materials, authentic and transadapted, those kinds of things that have got to be there. Ms. Casas, were you gonna say something? Uh, just that we already, as a practice, map our students take it in both English and Spanish so that we are tracking the kids and we'll have the longitudinal data now that we're taking it regularly. Mm -hmm. is, board, is that a motion for the board to vote on that? Right? That's the sense of urgency, at least at least uh, the prioritization of the board. It means there's some work for uh, the board. Although from a governance perspective, just to clarify, this is not a voting meeting, so that was just, <laughs> that was just a yeah. comment from me about a motion, mm -hmm. it was not. But thank you for that, that's great. That, and we're looking forward to, to receiving that and discerning that as well. Thank you all. Thank you, gracias. Dr. Mays, would you introduce the, the next item? I think we have one more item um, on this ag uh, on the agenda for this particular uh, item six, which is the historically underutilized business goals. We do. We have Mr. Ramos pitch hitting. Uh, Ms. Danita Caldwell isn't with us tonight, but we had a wonderful kickoff uh, with our hub vendors uh, just yesterday, I believe. Uh, and so got a chance to reset uh, where we are in our commitment uh, to our hub partners. And so uh, I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Ramos. And, and, and Dr. Mr. Mays, Gray. are you going to ask uh, Mr. Ramos to do this in dual language? Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ramos, if Mr. I would have had time to practice, I probably could have. <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you. President Rodriguez, uh, Dr. Mays, members of the board, uh, we wanted to give an update uh, basically on the hub program and our goals. Uh, with me, I have uh, Gerald Green, one of our hub coordinators, uh, to help me answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, but as you know, uh, the hub program was basically uh, instituted back in August of 2016 in preparation for the 2017 bomb program. And the goal of uh, the program was to advance equity and contracting uh, in which hubs can compete fairly uh, and participate in our bond program. And so that was the goal uh, of this department. Uh, we also, our mission is to provide fair and full opportunities for hub firms uh, so that they will broaden and enhance their uh, capacities to participate in the district procurement process. So that is our mission and our goal. Uh, we will present to today uh, what our goals uh, are for the 2017 bond program and where we are with those goals through September of 2022. So uh, we have not finished the 2017 bond program, so it is uh, a, a program that we are uh, currently in process with, uh, but we will give you an update of where we stand with our overall hub goals through uh, the September 2022 period. Uh, one of the things that we are proud to announce is that uh, when it comes to professional services uh, and the goals with architect and engineering, uh, we uh, have uh, surpassed our hub goals. Uh, total hub goals for uh, the professional services were 28.5% uh, through the end of September 2022. We actually were at 42.1%. So on professional services, we're actually 13.6% above our goals. 
And so we have exceeded our goals across all ethnic categories. Uh, you'll look at our goals uh, for African American, Asian, Native American, Hispanic, and women-owned. Uh, all the way to the far uh, right, you'll see what our hub goals are, uh, 1.9, 7.4, 9.4%, 9.8% for a total of 28.5%, and we have exceeded our goals in each of those categories. Keep it in mind that uh, these goals were established, again, back uh, in 2016 when, when the district did a feasibility study. And so we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation as far as our next steps uh, with a potential 2022 uh, hub program. When you look at our overall uh, construction uh, projects, this is one area that we know we need to work on. Uh, overall, our total goals uh, in this uh, area with construction uh, were 21.9 percent uh, was our overall hub goal. Currently, again, through the end of September 2022, we are at 19.8 percent, so we're actually 2.1 percent uh, below our goals. Uh, keep it in mind that, again, this is not the end of the 2017 bond program, but we also recognize that we uh, have not achieved our goal in the construction uh, area. And so when you look at uh, our goals for African American construction companies, Asian, Native American, uh, Hispanic, uh, we fell uh, and currently fall below our goal in those areas. Uh, Women-owned businesses is the only uh, category where we are above our goal. 10.2% was our goal, and we are currently at 13.2%. So we know that we have work to do there. Uh, we also continue to trend upward in this category. So currently, uh, we have uh, recent awards uh, of 4.5 million uh, to African American general contractors. Those are currently not reflected in these numbers. So we are trending upwards uh, in that category. Uh, but again, uh, our goal is to continue to find ways to improve uh, uh, potential uh, opportunities for hubs in the construction area. And so one of the things that we've looked at is uh, looking at a hub goal process review. And so what that basically uh, does is, uh, as Dr. Mays mentioned, uh, we were at, at an event yesterday, uh, which really brought in hubs throughout the district, because one of the things that we want to we, we want to learn is lessons learned from our 2017 bond program. So we've set goals, we've set uh, procurement criteria and processes, uh, and we believe that we are max doing our best to maximize opportunities for our hubs. But one of the things that we want to do is hear from our actual hubs and, and hear what their experiences have been uh, with our program, uh, with our processes, if they teamed up with general contractors, what their experience has been there. Uh, so we want to make sure that we really uh, uh, solicit their feedback on their experiences as hub firms trying to do business uh, with the district. Uh, at that event yesterday, we had over 150 registrants, so that was a great opportunity for us to really receive uh, constructive feedback uh, from our hub vendors. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to show them as well was I'm that... I'm sorry, Mr. Ramos, okay. I, we need to take a pause okay. and a break. We, we, are, we are not at uh, quorum, I got you. so I'm, I apologize for that, but I may ask you to go back one slide. Okay. Okay, so, I, so we'll take a break for a few minutes and come back in less than, less than 10 minutes, for sure. Maybe a little bit sooner.
much for your from this slide uh, just to reiterate the information and so although we met our hub goals for professional services uh, we do know that we are below our project our, our goals for construction and and vendors within the construction uh, criteria and so our hub our total percentage for uh, construction was 21.9 percent we're currently at 19.8 percent through the end of September so we're 2.1 percent below our goals uh, one of the things that we do know is that we continue to trend upward. Uh, we have contract, or we will contract uh, $4.5 million in awards uh, to an African American general contractors. So that will bring up those percentages. Uh, but we also recognize that we have work to do in this specific category. So uh, we have work to do in, in really trying to maximize how we can bring in a hub and women owned businesses uh, within the construction category. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, doing to move uh, forward with a in, the, in this direction is we have uh, contracted with uh, Opportunity Consulting uh, really to do a, a hub goal process review. So one of the areas that they're looking at is really looking to receive feedback from our hub vendors uh, to see what their experiences have been with the 2017 bond program. Uh, so in essence, we're looking at what, what are the lessons learned from the 2017 program? What did we do well? Uh, what do we need to work on and what can we improve to give uh, our hub vendors uh, more opportunities? And so that uh, study has begun. Uh, as Dr. Mays mentioned, we were at an event uh, yesterday. Uh, we had 150 hub vendors register for that event. And so that was a great opportunity for us to really receive uh, preliminary feedback uh, from our vendors as far as their overall experiences uh, with our program. And so um, one of the things that we really want to dive deep into is not only uh, do we provide training with new hub vendors in how they can uh, navigate through our procurement process, uh, that's also in partnership with IC Squared, but what experiences do hub vendors have that have been awarded contracts uh, even uh, uh, through uh, uh, true contracts themselves or partnering with a general contractor? What have been their experiences uh, as part of that program? Uh, and so we are uh, looking at feedback to see how uh, they navigate it through our processes. Do they have recommendations for us uh, to make uh, the process less burdensome uh, or more uh, streamlined? And so th this is valuable input uh, that we will be looking uh, forward to receiving. Uh, the, the consultants are also interviewing staff uh, to see if staff have uh, input and ideas as far as how we can streamline this process. Next slide. And so the next uh, few slides uh, you're going to see are a hub economic uh, impact analysis uh, study that we had done. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at is how uh, has the uh, uh, the district's awarding of contracts, how has that impacted uh, the local economy? And so we did contract uh, with a vendor to assist us uh, with uh, this study and, and, and look at our uh, impact metrics. And so there were three areas that uh, we looked at. Production, uh, which basically measured the revenues that uh, these businesses uh, impacted through the program. Uh, and so there were three areas, a direct impact, indirect, and then an induced impact. Uh, what type of, or, and how many jobs were created uh, as a result of the contracts that we awarded to our hub vendors? And then how were wages affected as far as overall cumulative earnings uh, for these employees? And so uh, we wanted to really look uh, at uh, the impact of those areas. Uh, next slide. We also looked at impact channels. And so basically uh, what that means is how did our contract with vendors generate economic activity in its business network? So not only did we generate economic activity uh, for our hub vendors, but also closely affiliated businesses and employees that would uh, be affected with uh, and through our contracts. And so some of the areas that we looked at were uh, a direct impact, basically direct contracts to our hub vendors. Uh, indirect impact as far as uh, the contracts that we awarded to our vendors, how did those vendors then 
go move forward and purchase goods and services from other uh, vendors uh, in the community. And then finally, induced uh, economic impact channels. And basically, that further looks at employees uh, in the jobs that uh, we awarded contracts uh, for and how did those uh, employees spend additional dollars within the economy. So those were all three areas that we looked at. And so the next slide has some uh, numbers uh, for us from the study. Uh, so we do know that uh, total production, uh, we uh, received a total production of $56 million uh, in, from our contracts. And so what that basically means is from direct contracts that we awarded to our hubs of seven, uh, $27 million that had a total production of $56 million. So that spending resulted uh, in an impact of $56 million. As far as overall jobs, uh, a direct impact uh, from our hub contracts, we created 147 jobs directly with our hub vendors. Uh, that had a total overall impact when you look at all other jobs created from those contracts in addition to the hubs of 346 jobs. Uh, total wages earned uh, directly uh, to our hubs, $10 million. Uh, indirectly, total of $21 million. And so the total impact uh, with our hub contracts uh, were $27 uh, million. Next slide. And so when you look at uh, minority, specifically uh, hub minority-owned businesses, we awarded contracts of $15.6 million. Uh, jobs that were supported, uh, 89 uh, jobs. And then overall wages, uh, we were looking at $6 million just in our minority-owned businesses. Uh, when you look at women-owned businesses, on the next slide, uh, we spent uh, $11.3 million in direct contracts uh, with women-owned businesses. Uh, the jobs that were supported, 58 jobs. And then total wages that were supported from these contracts, $3.8 million. We also looked at uh, the economic impact by campus, which basically was the economic impact in different categories, uh, from electrical work at various campuses, uh, the management services of the bond program, uh, district-wide audio-visual system upgrades, and so those are examples of uh, contracts that we awarded. Uh, the direct spend you see on the first column, uh, total pr production you see on the middle column, and then the jobs uh, created from each of those specific areas, and as well as the total wages uh, from uh, the contracts that we awarded, uh, not only to our hubs, but uh, additional wages uh, from closely affiliated groups. And so again, in looking at our overall program, uh, one of the, the, as far as what are the next steps, uh, our next step is to uh, do a disparity study uh, in preparation for a potential 2022 uh, bond program, and so that is underway. We should be ready to uh, give a report to the board in April of 2023, so that is coming. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, partner with a consultant to really help us analyze how our program uh, has uh, been uh, successfully uh, achieved uh, and where uh, areas are that we need to continue to work on. And so Opportunity Consulting is currently in the process of moving forward uh, with that study. Uh, and so we are hoping to uh, have a report uh, by January uh, from that study to really uh, give us some lessons learned and how we can improve and bring in more uh, hub firms into our uh, program for 2022. Um, and then again, uh, just looking at our processes. So one of the things that uh, we continually look at and, and receive feedback from our hubs is what, what uh, hurdles do you all face when looking at our procurement process? Uh, what uh, areas do you see that we can look at uh, to uh, make uh, opportunities uh, more available to you? Uh, I know that uh, one of the uh, responses and feedbacks that we've received is a specific uh, procurement method mm -hmm. uh, that hub vendors feel if uh, it was available to them, they would have a more uh, uh, competitive ability to compete with some of our smaller contracts. And so when we uh, bring forward our procurement methods to the board uh, to approve for our 2022 bond program, it will include uh, that procurement method. And so that was uh, just in, in, in having discussions with our hubs and their experiences, what can we do? Uh, we also know that sometimes hubs partner uh, with larger construction firms. So when construction firms uh, turn in their, uh, their proposals, 
they'll have hub goals and they are subcontracting with some of our hub vendors. Uh, one of the things that we know we need to do a better job with is hold our larger uh, general contractors mm -hmm. accountable for those mm -hmm. uh, metrics. And so if you uh, submitted a bid for certain percentages in different categories of subcontracting, <coughs> at the end of the construction job, did you uphold those goals? And if you didn't, then we are going to keep that data and that will uh, impact you on a future bid with the district. So that uh, was something that we didn't do with the 2017 bond program that we feel is very important uh, to hold our, our, our larger general contractors accountable with what is bid uh, in, our, in our processes. So with that, I will open it up to questions from the board. Thank uh, you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I did want to thank Mr. Ramos <clears throat> and Dr. Holly, in our absence, uh, these are conversations that we've been having uh, with hub vendors and, and just uh, to the team for being responsive uh, and willing to, to be pretty audacious in terms of the accountability that we're expecting uh, from some of our larger vendors uh, in terms of how we, again, execute with fidelity. And so I did want to say thank you to Mr. Ramos and, again, Mr. Green and, and uh, Danita in her absence and uh, Dr. Holly in her absence uh, for staying diligent as we focus on uh, making sure we have equity here. Thank you, uh, Trustee Singh. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I really appreciate the last thing you just said, uh, Mr. Ramos, about um, holding our contractors mm -hmm. accountable for their subcontracts. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't realized that that's something that we hadn't been doing, mm -hmm. so now I can now I can say we're doing that, so mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and so I guess I had one kind of a basic question. Are the hub goals created by us or are they created by like the hub program, like national, like is that? So they're, they're created by us based okay. on the uh, data that we have available to us from the disparity study. Okay. And so we will bring those goals forward to the board for discussion. Okay, uh, cool. Yes. Um, and so it seems like all of the Data, is it correct that all the data we've been looking at today um, is related to the bond? The 2017 bond, okay. yes. And so I think one of the things that I would love for our board to consider and our district to consider going forward is reestablishing our hub program uh, for professional services that are non-bond related. You know, so like our mental oh. health services, our, you know, curriculum, you know, like other things that we outsource because we used to have that program. Mm -hmm. and and for some reason we no longer have it and um and so i really you know somewhere um, down the list is how much what does it cost us extra money like i'm just wondering what you know why we don't have that program anymore and what are the steps that would take us to reestablish that program over the next couple of years so 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 historically i don't know the reason why we haven't included that uh, as far as including that in contracts outside of construction, it would involve uh, us tweaking our RFPs and contracts and RFQs. Mm -hmm. And so that, we, that, I mean, that can be done, uh, but that would be a board decision as well. Okay, thank you. Hey, is that the, so, so I, I also had a very similar question to that, which, which is how do we implement um, hub goals for professional services? So I think that's probably a discussion for our policy committee to have around some of the impact, and that'll probably go to the to the to our officers first, and then we'll go. But I, I'd add my my support for that question about how do we go about implementing that, um, and then understanding why we did that and why we took it away in the first place. So, um, Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you for all of this information and for the preview of what we should be looking ahead to as we start talking about a, a 22, 22 bond, assuming it passes, and, and what we're going to be looking at. So thank you for all of that. Um, and I have a question related uh, to the policy question that we've been talking about, about professional services and about um, what we'll be looking at with procurement. And thank you for going back to the community, to the hub um, contractors, and asking them kind of where the gaps are and, and helping shape it with our community, but uh, I know our audit, um, our auditors are looking at procurement. And I think as we're having this conversation, just wanting to be sure that the hub question is wrapped into their procurement work of the audit committee, kind of looking at what they're doing. Um, so it's where the policy and the audit are happening hand in hand as we have these decisions. So just want to flag that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Trustees, other questions? Oh, Trustee Zapata, thank you. At our last uh, meeting, oh, thank you for your presentation. At our last meeting, uh, we passed a resolution about the builder, the, the builder, better builder, better builder pro yes. And, and so I know we have that with our city and county as well and some incentive deals that we have through um, workforce development at the county. But the issue that has come up um, is that um, there is an enforcement uh, oversight. And so I'm wondering if that's something that we're doing because it was to the point that, um, you know, it was a, get a subcontract, subcontract and then they get another sub of a sub of us. Mm -hmm. And so then um, it got to where workers were not getting paid and the DA had to open a hotline. So if anybody doesn't get paid, you just call us and we'll go investigate mm -hmm. because there's no enforcement. <clears throat> so how do, how do you see that? So as part of the 2022 uh, bond program, we have built into our estimates a, a consultant that will enable us to track and make sure that uh, the contractors are complying uh, with the wage uh, rates that we have set. And so we will have somebody monitoring that by, uh, from contract to contract, each contract. Thank you, Trustee Zapata. Uh, trustees, any other questions? Thank you both for being here. Appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate all the work. So trustees, this ends the section on the information reports from the administration. And at this time, we will now move into the preview of the upcoming regular board agendas. This will allow the public and trustees the opportunity to review the agenda items that will be considered for a vote. At the next regular board meeting, AISD staff is available to answer any questions for, for tonight's preview. We'll begin tonight with item eight, which is the agenda preview for academics and curriculum. Trustees, are there any questions on this item? If not, I'm gonna to move to the next section, which is item nine, board administration. Trustees, are there any questions on these three items? Yes. Um, not exactly. Well, I guess the question is, so one of them is the alleged priorities for the 88th legislative session. Um, I was just wondering if anybody might like to just give a little recap on what might be different from what we've done in the past or um, anything like that. <laughs> or if there's anything that um, you might want to just highlight, if at all. Sure, I can just run through. Generally, we adopted legislative priorities uh, related to school finance in June, I believe, and that was to give us the opportunity over the summer to speak in our role as trustees about things like vouchers, basic allotment, recapture, a lot of the funding priorities that we've been talking about. So this set of priorities adds to that. We, we sought information from the community. We met um, several times with the policy committee um, which is Trustee Singh, Trustee Sapata, and I with um, Dr. Reach, with Edna Butts, um, with Mr. Ramos, with you know, many people um, to really discuss and shape additional priorities. And we came up with a list. We, we reviewed other organizations' priorities, other districts' priorities, advocacy organizations, um, a, a big range of groups, um, and came up with an additional list of priorities beyond the financials. So um, we're talking about parent and family involvement, accountability system that's beyond high stakes, um, multiple choice exams, uh, ballot language, unfunded mandates. Uh, we have several categories, um, accountabil accountability and assessment, academics and student support, a parent and family involvement section, a section about charter schools, um, the things we discussed about funding, information about governance, um, some school safety issues, some teacher retention issues, and um, some conversation about the teacher retirement system as well, which impacts um, the people who work for us in the future, and, and a lot of conversation about that happening right now. So there are many categories. These will be posted on our website and um, really gives us all the ability to advocate in our role as trustees with the community and the administration for very specific things that um, have been shaped. So. Thank you. Does that answer? That does. Okay. Thank you. 
and Trustee Boswell, I think one of the things, um, I know Trustee uh, Foster couldn't be with us. Uh, between now and the voting meeting, uh, uh, I know we encouraged him to, to speak with you. He had another legislative issue that he, he was gonna bring up, and that's one that we probably have heard before about trustee pay. Yes. And I just didn't know where that, that was, but I did encourage Trustee Foster to, to reach out to you, so I think that might be a question to discern between now and the board. Perfect, I'll have a conversation with him about that. We've talked about that off and on over the years, yeah. and I'll have a conversation with him about considering to adding that to our priorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and Dr. Reach, I would appreciate your guidance on the best way to do that, whether we would want a motion at our meeting um, or want to submit some ad adjusted priorities, um, a revised list of priorities. Um, so we can talk about that offline. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure since he's not here, yeah. I didn't want to speak for him. Thank but you. just you I know, appreciate making that. sure we connect before the next before the, the voting meeting. Yeah. Trustees, any other um, discussion on item nine? And if not, we'll move to item ten, business and finance. Um, that would be uh, five items there. Trustees, any questions on contracts for commercial real estate services? text pool authorized representatives, the alert travel assistance fund, grant fund, the school safety grant funds, and the monthly financials. If not, I'm gonna to move to item, uh, to section 11, human resources. I do wanna note that the administration is pulling item 11.5, and it will, it will not be at our voting meeting. So trustees, any questions on these items? Just to clarify, 11.5, it's not because it's Texas Tech, right? <laughs> that so, sounds like a Red Raider uh, issue. Um, any, other, any other questions? If not, trustees, I'm gonna move to section 12, policy. We have six items there. Trustee Singh. Um, so I have questions on 12.3 and 12.5. So 12.3 relates to DC local, um, and specifically it relates to um, board approvals for super for the superintendent's um, hiring decisions. And so I just want to make sure I understand. So what this policy is saying, saying that the board would approve. Um, hires that were in the position of executive director and above, correct? And prior to Dr. Elias Alde, the board was approving principal level and above. Is that correct? They were. Yes. I think we're going to have Dr. Reach. <laughs> Hello, Board of Trustees. Um, the prior DC, prior to 2020, uh, would uh, covered principals, executive directors, and above in Chapter 21 staff. Okay, and so Chapter 21 staff are teachers. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Brandy says yes. Okay. So a um, few more, but yeah. Okay. Teachers of the bulk. All right. So I. And the policy meeting, the policy committee is meeting again on this before we vote, right? Uh, we, the policy committee does meet on Monday. Okay. Uh, they have the ability to talk about any of the items that are currently before the board, but it's not scheduled as an individual item. Okay. Um, so I think I'm, st I'm a little hesitant. The only, I, I would love to retain the principal um, hiring as something that the board would vote on. <clears throat> Um, I don't know if that's something that was brought up with the policy. I don't, it was, okay. And how was the conversation? There were many perspectives within the policy committee and this came forward as a compromise position. Okay. This was the, the place that every, everyone could agree. At least it was worth moving it forward to the agenda and discussing it as a board if we felt the need to do that. Okay, and so if we wanted to um, make, if we wanted to kind of include the principal 
in this? Is it liter is it just literally just adding the word principals and any staff member in a position of executive director or above? Or are there some more legal language? Um, I, from, a, from a governance perspective, oh, sorry. sorry. I didn't have my microphone on, sorry. From a governance perspective, it would be a good time during this board meeting to kind of get feedback on that. Mm -hmm. And you had an opportunity, I think, to make a motion to add it during the, 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 the board voting meeting. And since we have five trustees and we're missing four perspectives, mm -hmm. um, I probably imagine that there's gonna be some discussions between now and then in the policy committee and with the administration with members of the board to see where we're at. Because I, I appreciate um, Trustee Buswell with the policy committee that they, they move forward with the policy, which we needed to do an agreement. And we have two opportunities to discuss I think what Trustee Singh, if, if I could restate what you're saying is, you're in support of adding principles, and I think usually, typically, in the board information, it'd be like, oh, okay, well, let's go around and see mm -hmm. if we have a majority of folks that you know support that, that position, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously have the other perspectives as well, and then we could give kind of a direction to the, to the administration, but since we have five trustees, I mean, we can still ask folks right now, but then, I think the administration probably has to work with the policy committee and with the board to try to make sure we get to that and potentially, you know, have a motion if that's what if that's what the board wants, Trustee Buzzle. And I have a question about, uh, about something that may or may not be helpful. Um, I went through and looked at what other districts do. I looked at the largest districts mm -hmm. uh, in the state, us to Round Rock, and then looked at some neighboring districts. And I'm happy to share that with Dr. Reach um, to send out if that would be useful just mm -hmm. for context to see what other districts are doing. And there's yeah. a very wide range um, of, of choices that people make. And, and many um, go deeper than principles. Some, you know, some yeah. retain authority for hiring and firing. It's, yeah. it's a big range. Some, you know, have delegate everything. So it, it's a big spectrum. And it might be helpful to see. Mm -hmm. um, but where we are right now is at one poll. Yeah. Up the spectrum, obviously. So. And, and I appreciate that what you all and the, and the policy committee did to try to balance the issue of do we have everybody and how inefficient or effective that is and versus what's really critical and strategic to how we support the district scorecard <laughs> and the expectations of the board. I, and I'm not sure, Dr. Reach, if, if right now is the right time or whether after all this discernment we can decide, actually we'll decide right before the posting of the agenda, because I'm just wondering out loud whether this is an item that, that um, will stay in consent or probably get pulled out for a discussion. Um, and there's probably a little bit more discernment to be made before we do that, but Trustee Sabata. So could, uh, I know, it used to be that way, right? The, the, the board used to be part of that process and then it was changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know why it was changed. Yeah, so uh, it was changed in when the board chose the superintendent. There was negotiations that were done, employment negotiations, and that was one of the things that was negotiated was the ability for the superintendent to hire and fire with the full expectation I think of the board to say, look, you're you're our employee, and I'm looking at you, Dr. He's like, you're our employee. We're going to hold you accountable for the outcomes of our district scorecard, and the discussions with our employee in general were like, if you're going to hold me accountable, then I need to have the freedom to hire and fire so that I can give you the outcomes that you want. And so, obviously, we've experimented with that model, um, and we've decided to retract part of that and say, well, we're not going to do like we used to do everything because that's also um, from a governance perspective is also taking we took up a lot of time on the board as well. So our board meetings, which typically end at 10 o'clock, maybe midnight or, or later, what, what they were ending late. And so one of the things was like, well, why are we doing certain classes of individuals when really it's a consent agenda item or it's something that we're not that we're holding the, the superintendent accountable for as we hire and fire three individuals, right? Our board counsel, our superintendent, and our auditor, or, in, or now our auditor. Um, uh, Gibson consultant. Vendor, our, our vendor now. And so the idea was how to balance that to say we got to hold the superintendent accountable and then they get to hire and fire folks. Um, 
however they, they see fit of the leadership team. And so that's the balancing act of it. But that was, that was the discussion. And at the time, the board chose to be willing to do that. And now, obviously, with an interim, we worked with Dr. Mays on trying to see what's the right balance for that as well. And so now we're trying to, I think as Trustee Singh had mentioned before, just trying to codify and put into policy what we've agreed to with the current interim superintendent. And how we move forward, I think, is up to the next the next iteration of the board. I don't know if, if Trustee Singh or Trustee Boswell, Trustee Wagner, if you've got any thoughts. All, all you have to also comment. Yeah, sorry. Or we would also have to revisit that if the, when we hire a new superintendent, whoever. I think that the, 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 yes, the board that hires the next superintendent will have to go through negotiations for employment. So as you right. know, and, and this board has committed, and, and we hope that the next board will, will do that. We've committed to having a transparent process mm -hmm. where we have an open process at the end of the last two or three candidates. Um, and then what ends up happening is when we choose someone, then we go into contract. It's kind of in reverse, but because right. we kind of are telling folks mm -hmm. this is who we we're going to choose. But then there's these 21 days where you have this period of time where you negotiate in the contract mm -hmm. different specific items, and this could be one of them. But I think the board at the time will make a decision and de determination of, of where they are. And I think to that end. I think there, the the policy committee has made a determination, kind of a balancing, a, a compromise, if you will, about what positions to could be included in there, um, and then as you can tell, Trustee Singh wants to add principles, and so the only question is, well, what is the what is the body, the governance body, choose to do? Are there five votes to to include the principles or not? And that's a discussion I think we need to have with the entirety of the board. Do we have a personnel committee? We do. We have a policy committee, okay. but we do not have an HR committee okay. or person. Is that what you mean, like a person? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's a good question, um, and we probably don't have a personnel committee because we don't hire and fire all of the eleven thousand five hundred <laughs> employees. That would be a separate board meeting, I think. Yeah. In addition to the ones we already have. Um, Trustees, any other questions? It's a good question. I had a question about a different policy also. Yes, Sorry, Trustee Singh. Yeah. A couple of questions mm -hmm. today. Okay, for um, 12.5 related to the special education videos. Um, when we were talking about, um, when we were talking about videos uh, for special education during the bond, stuff i remember i had asked you dr mays hey do we you know it sounded like we do allow parents to you know request a video um of, of incidents if they want to um and i was and i can't recall how do we let parents know that they have this option to request videos uh so um following a conversation that the board actually had with a, a parent um through a, a grievance hearing We've been working with that parent to look at how we share that information out. We've actually created a website now on our special education webpage mm -hmm. that shares how you request, what the process is, how you follow up if you disagree with the outcome, how you request a review, because there's technically could be two requests. The request mm -hmm. to place the camera, the request to review the camera footage. Okay. Um, and how you do both those processes. Um, and so that information now lives on our website in addition to our policy where it already was. Um, and so that's the, the major way on how that information is shared with the public. Okay. I, I guess what I was, that's really good to know that we have that website. And how do parents know about that website? Uh, I, I think that since it's under our SPED section, it's where parents would find information about our SPED department and the okay. offerings that special education provide to our families. Got it. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, from... And, and I don't even know if this would belong in policy, so I would probably appreciate some guidance on that. But I think if we really want to take that equity lens on this policy to ensure that all parents are, like they, first of all, know that they have the right to ask this and they have a way with little barriers that they could request it. Um, is there some language 
that could go. I keep looking for Christine, but she's not here. Is she there, actually is online. Oh, hey, Christine. Um, you know, is there a way, like, hey. do, would that would that even belong in policy? Um, and if so, like, is that overkill? Or I mean, I think I think I would like, like, I personally would like to see us have something in policy that says, this is how we are going to inform parents that they have this option. Tracy Sinkin. <laughs> Can I ask her, are you requesting that we bring this to the policy committee or? If it's something that would be appropriate to put in policy. I mean, I, I personally would like it. So yes, maybe it would go to the policy committee. Um, you know, a, a sentence or two in here that says like, you know, every, every parent with a child in special education would receive a letter at the beginning of the year saying, you know, outlining the steps to request a video camera or like whatever, whatever that is, but just something that holds us accountable to ensure that we are really ensuring, we are really letting all parents know how they can do this and that they have this right to request video camera footage. Uh, um, I would love to get some discussion with our SPED team to understand mm -hmm. uh, what capabilities and what processes we may already have in place okay. that this would align with, and then we could bring it to the policy committee to see if that's something the policy committee would want to <clears throat> consider. Okay, that'll be great, thank you. Okay, can I just ask one question about that? And um, I'm getting into implementation a little bit here, but um, isn't it's my understanding that parents at the beginning of the year sign a document that kind of signs off on all kinds of different things. I forget what it's called. An IEP? No, this for all students. The safeguards. Is it safeguards? Well, no, no, I'm not. Forget about special education. No, I'm just the talking, student handbook. No, I'm talking about when. A parent uh, registers their child, and then they sign oh, the off SR290. on all kinds of, of authorizations. That's and the SR290 form. Is there, and I think there, it takes a lot, I think, to add something to that, but is that a place where there's an opportunity? And I think it's probably more of an implementation question because that's something that all parents sign. But again, I, I, I would defer to the administration on that versus kind of, and I think you're asking the right question. Is, does it belong in policy, or is that something that can be implemented by the administration through that form? Because I know that one form is you know, is used by every single, I mean, every student or parent has to sign that form. And I know uh, it takes a lot to kind of, I know you're trying to be really efficient and effective with that form of what you put in there. But For example, our notice of human sexuality curriculum is included on our SR290 form. So I think so to your to your I think to your question, Trustee Singh, there's some discernment that has to be done by the administration about what the most effective way is. Is it to add it to the policy or is it something that, that can be implemented? Yeah, and it could be maybe a hybrid where the policy is kind of vague. It just says that, you know, the district will communicate to every parent yep. in a way that is accessible to them mm -hmm. that they have this option. Mm -hmm. And then you guys figure out what that is. Yeah. yeah. Trustee uh Sabat. Well, I, I think to, so that every student sees that that's um, an option for them, I think the handbook is a place, the student handbook, because uh, parents, it's all related to the students' uh, needs, and, and parents do get that handbook, and so they could, they could have that information as well. But I think that would be um, other areas of students with disabilities and all the things that, that they have access to uh, so that all students know. So um, if it uh, works for the trustees, I think the administration can discuss the various options we could look at, determine one that we believe would work well to meet the intent that we heard, and then bring that to the policy committee to share see if the policy committee then feels is there another step or do we just need to update the board on here's what we're doing thank you so trustees any other um questions on item on section 12. if not i'm going to move to section 13 other are there any questions on the uh three items here If not, this ends our uh, regular agenda preview. Um, Secretary Singh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. 
Is there, is there a second? Having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Zapata to adjourn, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. This meeting is now adjourned at 9.43 p.m. Thank you very much.